Hey, hey, Jelly Toast here, back with more great Ace Attorney Chronicles. Let's finish this trial. I don't know if I'll be able to finish this trial today, but I will try. I don't remember the voice I gave him. Good morning to you, Mr. Naduhuru. Ah, good morning, Professor. Ready for today's proceedings? I hope so. I should be. Even I, with nothing left to... Good morning, my dear fellows. Oh, Mr. Sholmes, you're here. Why, naturally, a true gentleman stands shoulder to shoulder with his friends in battle at all times. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I'll see you later then. <laughs> now, Professor, we really need you to remain calm in the courtroom today. Yes, do your hardest to not enter the witness stand uninvited again. Yes, I will. I, I realize it was a mistake, but I... My dear fellows, I must interject. Oh, you're still here, Mr. Sholmes. What's the matter? Surely you've overlooked some praise, have you not? To be cast in my direction, hmm? Sorry, I don't follow. Must I spell it out? I, the great Herlock Sholmes, the greatest detective of worldwide acclamation. I rose at some ungodly hour to be here now. First thing in the morning, a miracle, you must agree. Well, if I must agree, then... As you know, my sleep is quite impregnable. Iris had to employ her full gamut of tactics. She pulled the covers off, shook me, poked both cheeks, punched me, and kicked me from the bed. Then she poured a boiling cup of her latest experimental blend on my face, as, and at last I was bestirred. Oh my, Iris has been busy. Iris doesn't have an inner to go that far. She's too nice. Ah, I sense the spirit of a fellow scientist, one who relishes the infinite possibilities of blending tea. I'm the one worthy of praise here, not Iris. This is my victory. Sorry to cut in. What? Oh, Inspector Gregson, good morning. Gregson, my dear fellow, why the grim expression at this delightfully early hour? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's because I've been confronted with a grimmer expression, eh? Dear me, are you going to take that insert lying down, Professor? What? What? I don't know. Poor professor. Hey, yo, Smooth. How you doing? Thanks for joining. Happy Monday. Yo, yo. I'm streaming on a Monday because... So I think starting from Thursday on, I will be busy. And next week, I will be busy. But yeah, next week, I probably won't stream at all. Because I'm going to Disneyland again. Anyway, here's the paperwork you asked for. What paperwork? Ah, oh, I took the liberty of requesting it yesterday. I have a feeling it may prove useful. You won't believe the hoops I had to jump through to get this brought out to, of the archives. It's a professor's autopsy report. That... that mass murderers? Who killed five members of the aristocracy? Oh, that professor. Well, he was found guilty in a closed trial ten years ago now. It was all done on the ramps. It was quite quickly executed soon after the trial. It's all in here. The killer's autopsy report. What does that have to do with this case? Hold up, hold up, hold up. Before I read that. Condemned prisoner, redacted for confidentiality, pseudonym to professor, death by hanging confirmed at midnight 17th June, Courtney Stevens. Is that going to be Courtney Scythe? Bum bum ba -dum. I don't know what to say. Thank you, Inspector. You're not stalking Goofy? Okay, I have never seen Goofy in Disneyland. All the times I went. Halloween, Christmas, February. Have not seen Goofy. I've only seen Mickey and Minnie, Ariel, Elsa Anna, and um, Miguel from Coco. I lied. Wait, was that Goofy? Or was that Captain Hook? During Halloween, someone was dressed in a skeleton suit by the tra main train station. I don't remember if that was Goofy or not. Whoopsie! Yes, much obliged, Drexen. Us lowly lot at the yard are just doing what we can. In the shadow of the great detective, Sholmes, of course. Well then, Professor Hairbrain, this is it. Today we're going to lay all this to rest at last. I wish you the best of luck, Professor. I suppose he'll be in there today, will he? Jebba, 
Yes, we expect the prosecution to summon him as a witness. Still amazed that you managed to find him in just one day. Really? Oh, you both so much. Counsel and the defendant! The trial is about to resume. Kindly make your way into the courtroom at once. This is it then, the final chapter. Funny, my heart's racing a little. I've not felt this before, actually. The strange foreboding. As if something's going to happen in this trial that I'm not ready for. But I can't let that distract me from the only thing that really matters. Finding the truth. Do they have Kingdom Hearts characters? They don't! That makes me so mad. I'm like, you're gonna make this giant video game franchise and not do anything with those characters? And I thought that they would have Kingdom Hearts swag in like the merch stores. I didn't see anything. And then finally, I saw like um, iPhone covers and pop sockets. That's it. It kind of sucks. In the name of Her Majesty the Queen, I hereby declare this court to be in session again. We resume the public hearing of Albert Herbrand, here present, who stands accused for murder. All the counsels for the prosecution and defense are ready to proceed. Ah! Uh. The prosecution is ready, my lord. The defense is ready, my lord. As promised, Lord Van Zeeks has his apprentice hit with him. His apprentice with memory loss. I kind of wish the mouse on Yunosuke's shoulder was on the other side so we could see it more. If I may, Lord Vanzix. Yes, my lord. There appears to be someone standing at your side. Ah, oh, yes, my apprentice and assistant. The prosecution believes today's proceedings will see the complexity of this case rise considerably. I therefore instructed my assistant to attend to ensure the smooth running of the trial. And the smooth running of liquid refreshments, by the look of it. The way he holds himself, the way he moves. It couldn't be anyone else. But he's still suffering from amnesia, so there's really nothing we can do at the moment. I know, but... Oh, this is so very hard. It would appear that the prosecution has done a fine job in responding to demands that the court made yesterday. I understand you have successfully secured the engineer who disappeared from the scene of the on the day in question. Yes, my lord. I intend to call him as a witness shortly. Very good, very good. Now then, mental ladies and gentlemen of the jury, who have been chosen at random to represent the will of the people in this courtroom today? Are you ready and willing to proceed? I don't remember their voices. We need to open a theme park. But would they really have like that many rides? To have, I mean, it would be cool if it's, a, if it's like, hey, like go through a Kingdom Hearts theme roller coaster where you're like flying through worlds, or like, yeah, you're on the gummy ship and you gotta blast stuff. Um, uh, Square Enix just needs to make better games. Oh, uh... <laughs> of course, my lord. I'm sure we all understand the importance of doing our civic duty. I do so despise deception and deceit. I find it so very wearing. Take a man's life at the conjuring trick. It is against the magician's code, not to mention the law. I don't think scientists should feel the wrath of God, if you ask me. Um, you have to listen to what's on both sides, defense. And, um, they said I'm one. That's it, isn't it? Wasn't it like this in my day? Wasn't like this at all. If all parties are ready to proceed, you may begin, Lord Van Zix. Before I do, my lord, there is a report I must read to the court. Yesterday at the Great Exhibition Grounds, the evidence of primary importance in this case. The Super High Voltage Instantaneous Kinesis Machine, which was installed on the experimentation stage, was deliberately destroyed in an explosion affected by an unknown person or persons. It was... What?! An explosion! This is an outrage! Roasting now. I mean, I will love Squaresoft for all the older Final Fantasies that they did, and Chrono Trigger, Chrono Cross. Um, but man, their latest games... I mean, Final Fantasy XIV is pretty fun too. But lately, their Final Fantasy games have just been... 
And Kingdom Hearts has been... I don't know, like, nothing from Square Enix is exciting. They did publish Nier, but, you know, that's only publishing. They didn't create it. And that's all Yoko Taro. And so, I, I don't know. Square is losing its charm. Yes, I heard this grave news yesterday. Scotland Yard submitted a report to my office in the evening. I read that the machine was blasted to smithers and the wreckage reduced to ashes and the flames. I have here a photographic print of the scene, taken in the wake of the explosion. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that's gonna be what happened. There's a trapdoor, as we explored in the machine. So the real... The real dude, odious man, he fell in to the ground. The body we saw in the crystal tower was a was the wax doll because we found the shard of glass in it. But then, how did he get shot? I don't know. It shows what little remains of the machine. Hmm. Yes, a terrible business. There's the little mouse! He did it to destroy the evidence, did he? That Enoch Drebber. The court will take this print as evidence, Council. Post explosion. Late yesterday afternoon, the protection offered by to the machine by the blah 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 was revoked. However, before a thorough investigation could begin, the invention was obliterated from existence. As such, this will become a very different trial. How? It's the same. We we still have no information to go on. As it stands now, with no evidence on which to draw meaningful conclusions, the authenticity of the Kinesis machine will remain forever in obscurity. Hmm, indeed. A most unfortunate state of affairs. However, one thing remains clear. The victim's death was the result of the actions of the accused. Of that we can be certain. But it was the accused himself who was the operating the machine and who ultimately caused its loss of control. As Lord Van Zeeks rightly says, this is a very different trial now. The accused accepts responsibility for his part in the events that transpired. He acknowledges that Mr. Asmund died as a result of the accident caused by his machine's malfunction. However, unbeknownst to the professor, he was being deliberately deceived by a pair of very clever fraudsters. Names, counsel, if you please. The engineer, Mr. Enoch Drebber, and the victim herself, Mr. Odious Man. So what exactly were these two men up to behind the defendant's back? The defense intends to expose that information, thus establishing the unequivocal innocence of the defendant. Oh, but one game Square did get right. Dragon Quest XI. That game is awesome. Again, I don't know if they created- No, they definitely created it, because, like, it's the 11th Dragon Quest. Yo, what up, Regal? Happy Monday! I hope you had a good weekend! There's no audio? Oh, because there's no music right now. Thank you, Councils. The positions of the prosecution and defense have been clearly stated. Lord Van Zeek, summon your first witness, please. Because you're muted. I'm muted! At once, my lord. The prosecution calls the engineer, Mr. Enoch Drebber, to the stand. <gasps> Why you mute me? <laughs> oh, this freaky guy. Oh, gosh. Hate your name and occupation for the court. I don't remember the voice I gave him. I got sick of your voice, I'm sorry. You have to understand, it's super annoying. <gasps> no! <laughs> name, Enoch Drebber. Occupation. Art to pin down, I would say. Oh, I gave him court, sort of an Alan Rickman thing. See the black one? Oh, we are sure feels so I've seen it somewhere before. Oh, you too. I said the exact same feeling myself. Hmm. The file indicates that you are currently being investigated in connection with another case. The theft of a waxwork model, is it? A most extraordinary sounding business. But that has no bearing on this trial, I assure you. Leave it from your mind. You're familiar with the public experiment carried out at the Great Exhibition some days ago. The accused super-high-voltage instantaneous kinesis demonstration. 
Yes, you could say that. I am aware of it. There was a terrible accident, wasn't there? Even more robot boys, yeah. It was you, Mr. Drebber, who constructed the vast machine used in the experiment. Or so our investigations indicate. Can you confirm your involvement? Yes, I constructed it, in the precise accordance with the blueprints, but that's all. Then the court would be very interested to hear your thoughts about the machine, I'm sure. What is up with this dude? Is he like... Is he a cyborg? Or is he... No. He's either a cyborg, or he's just totally a robot. An amazing device, if you ask me. A pinnacle of modern science, making instantaneous kinesis a reality at last. What? Good, good gracious, do you mean to say that the experiment was bona fide? Is that your belief, sir? Yes, that is very much my belief. Such a waste that it blew up. Borderline our dual one, because I was going for the Alan Rickman voice. Jelly's taking us to Disney World. Not World, land. Disney World is in Florida. We've already established the machine was nothing more than a prop for an elaborate conjuring trick. You've established nothing of the sort. All that was shown during yesterday's proceedings is that the same outcome could have been produced by means of stage trickery. The defense merely proposed a method and demonstrated its feasibility, nothing more. But, 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 but. We procrastinated long enough, I feel. Witness, you now give your formal testimony. About the machine that you constructed for the purpose of the demonstration at the Great Exhibition. Understood. Is he in cahoots with someone? I mean, definitely odious, man. Yeah, he has to be in co cahoots with someone because he stole the wax model. I met the young professor approximately one year ago through Mr. Asman's introduction. He provided me with the blueprints and I constructed the machine to his precise specifications. It was no trick. If the whole show was a fraud, it would have required a body double. Tell me, did the victim have a twin? All the spectators saw the birdcage appear above the heads and then crash headfirst into the crystal tower. A terrible accident, I grant you. Perhaps the science on which the machine was built was flawed somehow. A body double? That goes without saying, surely. To give the impression that something has moved when in reality it hasn't, it's a basic conjuring principle. The deception cannot be achieved without substituting the original with the fake at some point in the performance. But would I be right in saying, you haven't managed to establish anything along those lines? Ugh. Incidentally, the prosecution has already confirmed that Mr. Rasmund had no twin siblings. Hmm. It's my understanding that this witness is well versed in conjuring artfulness. But such talents do not indicate that he was actually able to accomplish what he claims. Namely the construction of what, by all accounts, must have been an extremely complex scientific machine. Whatever do you mean. Yesterday's proceedings brought the true manner of your past exploits past- True nature of your past exploits to light, Mr. Drebber. Indeed it did, my lord. As a swindler who preys on innocent scientists to elicit government grant money through conjuring know-how. Yes, it's true that I possess considerable knowledge of stage magic. But crucially, my scientific knowledge more than matches that of any academic in the field. Investigation of the witnesses' workshop attests to that claim, my lord. As evidence, the police found this Royal Society trophy for the young talent in science there. Yes, that's true. We spotted it there ourselves. If a hypothesis is sound, it can always be forged into a physical manifestation with sufficient skill. Though I may have sold the secrets of some deceptive wells to sniffling tentless scientists in the past. Would, would you therefore assert that the explosion of the machine was an unfortunate accident or, of course, a deliberate act of murder carried it- Ah! What the heck? No, I lost battery! Uh, you have 17 seats in a classroom and 42 weeks of class per year. If you have an average of four teachers per year and you spend eight hours doing school labor, how much are you willing to pay for lunch? Zero dollars! Give me free lunch. 
Also, hey, Golden, how you doing? Thanks for joining. Happy Monday. Uh, misuse of science. <laughs> oh my gosh. I know what else about him creeps me out and I don't like about him. He kind of looks like Sephiroth. Wearing all black, long coat, long white hair. Oh, gross. Counsel for the defense, your cross-examination, please. Yes, my lord. Okay, first of all. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna save to be safe. I'm gonna present the wax body double here without pressing. Mm, let's see if- wait, I should examine this. Okay, nothing really much to examine, it's just that it has a trapdoor. Um, head of Professor Waxwork. Uh, it would appear in the form of the Crystal Tower. No! Wrong! Ah! <laughs> Did myself a favor and delete my social media app so I won't be on those anymore. Oh, dang! That's dedication. Okay, I'll press. Of course, that's it! Mr. Asma was a twin! No, why would you say that? Perhaps my learned friend wasn't listening earlier. Mr. Asman had no twin siblings. No, I heard you before, but the thread of hope hadn't quite left me. The demonstration could have been a trick if there was somebody who looked sufficiently like the victim. But Dr. Scythe absolutely ruled out that as a pos possibility. It is beyond question that the victim himself, Mr. Asman, did move from the stage to the Crystal Tower. The fingerprints found at the scene attest to the facts. So it can't have been orchestrated using someone who looked identical to Mr. Asman, then. What are you thinking, Mr. Naruhodo? Oh, no, nothing. Just that the idea of someone who looked identical to the victim is playing on my mind. A wax double! Fine, I'll press everything. Oh, I don't want to press everything. I'll just press 3, 4, and 5. <laughs> It crashed head first, you say. According to the uh, uh, Mark robot, according to the many witness reports from those there at the time, yes. Were you not there at the exhibition grounds on the day? Hmm, unlikely. I rarely leave my workshop. Yet another of your unique inventions was found at the scene. Well, it was the unveiling of a machine I'd labor over for many months. I saw it clearly with my own eyes, the birdcage plummeting headfirst into the tower. So you were there. What a surprise! I believe the victim's neck was broken from the headlong fall, wasn't it? No? I'll talk to oh, it was, okay. How much of a wound to the chest that pierced the heart? Broken vertebra, most likely resulting from impact after sudden fall from crucible height. That doesn't say his neck broke, it's just that his spine broke. How would you have come by that information? Even an infernal recluse like me reads the papers, you know. According to the reports, two injuries were apparent on the victim's body. Yes, he'd been stabbed in the chest by a screwdriver believed to belong to the defendant. And he had broken vertebrae as a result from a fall from considerable height. Corette, my learned friend has been doing his research, it seems. Do we know which injury was the fatal one? Sadly not. Forensic science is not yet at a level where such things can be determined. Hmm. What we do know is that the victim died having sustained both injuries at some point during the experiment. And since he was found in the birdcage with his neck broken... It's obvious that he fell from a considerable height. Hmm, I suppose that's hard to deny. Or is it? You'll have to text me when you go live or message me or smoke signals. Don't you get email notification? A terrible accident. So you understood the science, did you? Not in the slightest. Oh, right. As I've said a number of times, I'm an engineer. My job is to manufacture according to the blueprints I've given. 
I would be inviting manifold problems if I foolishly allowed my brain to digest the ideas behind them. I could be accused of stealing those ideas, for example. But how is it possible to construct a machine without really understanding the principles it relies on? Well, you're practicing law without really understanding the principles it relies on, aren't you? No, that's what you study in school. A very good point. This is not good! Stand up for yourself, Mr. Narukuro. The point is, the experiment resulted in instantaneous kinesis taking place. As such, the science must be sound. Yes, and really, experimental results are all that matters when it comes to proving a hypothesis. This is really ma maddening because I'm like, it's the body double! He was killed underneath the machine! But I don't know how to get to that point. He's certainly very sure of himself. What do you think, Mr. Naruhodo? Well, now that the machine has been completely destroyed by yesterday's explosion, it's going to be impossible to argue its authenticity one way or the other. But if we're unable to establish that it was a piece of stage trickery rather than genuine science, we will have no grounds on which to demonstrate Professor Hairbrain's innocence. Well, both Mr. Aswin and this man in the stand tricked the professor and used him. They took advantage of his na na naivety and his unbending belief in his work, and I won't let them get away with it. And seeing as the professor is an old friend of Lord Van Zeek's, what on earth must he be feeling towards Drubber? FBS engineers know basic science. Aperture science. We do what we must because we can. So you were already acquitted Mr. Asmund himself? Not really. By chance, I seen his name mentioned in the papers, that's all. But I had no interest in his private affairs. If he was an unscrupulous investor, it was no concern of mine. As long as people pay their bills, I take up my tools and construct what they ask for. But why did Mr. Asmund approach you in particular then? Who can say? I presume because my name is associated with excellence in engineering. Not to mention excellence in fraud. Oh! <laughs> Hard to gauge, but the point is, all I did was construct the machine according to the blueprints I was given. In other words, the Kinesis machine was built on solid scientific principles. Yes, you might say that. Professor Hairbrain certainly has a mind like no other. Now JT has to play Portal on stream. Dude, I tried to play Portal for my video game class in grad school. I threw... Like, I needed to throw up after the first two stages. Two! He just said he didn't understand the principles. He doesn't understand the principles of the science, but he understands the principles of the trick of the fraud. This man is an imposter! <laughs> it's clear that you have both scientific knowledge and knowledge of conjuring magic, however. The more knowledge you have, the better equipped you are ha to handle whatever comes along. But your implication is that I furnished the machine with some trickery, I think. It's a possibility that we have to explore. Unfortunately though, that machine has been blown to Kingdom Come. So there's really nothing left to explore, is there? It appears that the Kinesis machine was fitted with a timed explosive device of some kind. And there's nothing left of that device either. Oh, the shrinkle shred of evidence remaining, I hear. He must have planned all this from the outset. But in any case, it's abundantly clear that the experiment couldn't have been a trick. Before you go into a portal, just close your eyes. Even moving around the room makes me sick. Like that first person view, especially in um like portal um first person shooters, gets me so sick. I want to just throw up and die. Uh... Um... Oh! Oh! Sorry, I'm cheating because I don't want to think too much about this. Um... Because he said he crashed head first. It's damaged at the bottom! I knew something was wrong with the with the statement that his neck was broken because I was like, no, the vertebrae snapping isn't the main issue. Mirror's Edge? I haven't played Mirror's Edge and I don't think I want to. Wow, Grandma. I've been weak to like motion sickness since I was little. It freaking sucks. We examined the birdcage that crashed into the Crystal Tower ourselves. 
As you can see, the cage, which is a wooden construction, has sustained damage in one particular spot. Following the explosion, it fell some 30 feet into the glass of the crystal tower. That level of damage is to be expected, surely. I agree, the damage itself is entirely understandable. What doesn't make sense is the location of that damage. All the breakages in the wood are at the base of the birdcage, not the top. What are you saying? That's the opposite of where they should be. That's right, my lord. The birdcage that was at the scene is damaged at its base. So we have reports of the birdcage falling headlong into the crystal tower, yet the damage is at the bottom. The only way to reconcile these two facts is to accept that there were two birdcages in play that day, which were at some point switched. Switched during what wasn't a scientific experiment at all, but an elaborate piece of stage trickery. Ah! Why was the first half of that word orange? Good gracious, explain yourself with this. I... Well... If we examine the facts, there's only one logical conclusion we can draw. The damage on the base of the birdcage clearly indicates that it crashed tail first into the tower. But multiple witness reports claim it fell head first. The birdcage materialized in the sky next to a balloon flying over the stage following a spontaneous explosion, at an altitude of some 60 feet above ground level. Which is approximately 18 meters. That doesn't help me, but okay. It then proceeded to fall some 30 feet into the crystal tower in the ensuing deflagration. Witness- Oop, I missed that. Uh, his history. Uh, witness reports amid such chaos are notoriously unreliable. Objection! But the victim's net was broken! He plummeted 30 feet inside a heavy wooden cage. However he fell, it would be unsurprising to find one or two of his vertebrae crushed. What oh, wouldn't? A riveting scientific analysis of events from the prosecution there. Though to be even more rigorous, you would have to say it was only one vertebrae, actually. He wasn't quiet for long, and also how'd you know that? I find it hard to see what's motivating Lord Van Zeeks. This witness is clearly a swindler, and one who deceived a personal friend of his. If you're going to establish this deception, do it right. Sorry? I feel like that's the undertone here. Ah yes, and there is one more point that the fence appears to have forgotten. It obviously wasn't a trick, as a certainly certain truth very plainly demonstrates. What? It seems to me that the cross-examination had better continue and let, until we resolve this matter. Mr. Trevor, you will amend your testimony with the details of this truth. Of course, we must treat the matter scientifically, after all. Ah, uh, I nearly had him there. So freaky. They used to make me sick, but slowly got uh, used to the lower camera and control sensitivity. I start with lower, slower, calming games, Minecraft. Ugh, I, I can't do it, man. The kinesis clearly took place because there's nowhere else 30 feet high from the Berkeys to have fallen from. I'm sorry? The balloon? Um. I- okay, sorry, I'm cheating again, but I want to make sure I present the right evidence. It is a sketch. You liar! This is a diagram of the experimentation stage and its surroundings. We know that somehow the birdcage appeared in midair before falling down into the crystal tower. A fall of about 30 feet, or 9 meters. However, if you examine the diagram carefully, you'll see that there is one other possible location from which the birdcage could have fallen. The same distance of 30 feet. No! Well, it appears that defense has a possible explanation to put forward. Go ahead, counsel. Yes, my lord. Of course. You will indicate to the place to which you are referring on the same diagram. The alternative location from which the birdcage could possibly have fallen the requisite 30 feet. 
Isn't it the sky? I just wanted to make sure. <gasps> I just want to finish this trial! Wait, what? Oh, we're not talking about this one. We're talking about where he really died. Okay. Okay. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. The place I'm referring to is here. But that's where the birdcage would have been to begin with. Which is exactly the point, my lord. Yes, the birdcage was the machine on the stage. But what we must also consider is the height of the stage itself. Go on, Council. It turns out that the experimentation stage was built at a considerable height above ground level. If you look at the diagram, in fact, you'll see it's about the same height above the ground as the balloon was above the crash site. It's funny because you're okay with roller coasters, but I'm, uh, I can't handle most FPF games. I think it's because roller coasters, they go by too fast, and it's because I can see where the tracks are going, so I know, like, which direction I'm going, so my body doesn't freak out. But with games, I'm not, like, familiar with the sensitivity, um, and, um, yeah, I don't know where I have to go, so I have to keep looking around, and it makes me dizzy. Can you stream a YouTube video of the rest of these trials at 2.0 speed? No, I'm gonna play it myself. When the experiment got underway, the machine and the birdcage were engulfed in steam. At that moment, the floor of the stage gave way and, if we assume there to be a void underneath, this birdcage and the one seen by the audience would have fallen almost exactly the same distance. Examine the tower. Examine it! If it's empty, then we're right. Once again, my lord. This all points to the fact that there was not one birdcage, but two. My learned friend has no evidence that the stage had such a contrivance in its design. Someone is responsible for the criminal destruction of the kinesis machine itself, it's true. However, the stage still stands. And take a moment to look at the photographic prints of the scene following yesterday's explosion. Good lord, the metal grill that formed the floor of the machine is undone! Yes, most likely blown open by the force of the explosion that destroyed the rest of the machine. The defense calls for the space below the stage to be investigated immediately. So what you're saying is PlayStation VR would be perfect for you. Some, some of it, like, um, when I used to work with VR stuff, uh, when I, when I wrote a roller coaster thing, um, it made me sick because I was like, I don't know this track. I can't see this track. But when I was in the VR environment itself and I had like, the power to control like where I was going, where I was looking. It it was good. Like I didn't get sick. So Mr. Drubber. It was you who built a Kinesis machine. Which means that it was you who built the two bird cages that were used to carry out this deception. Uh, uh Whether Professor Hairbrain's hypothesis is sound or not makes no difference, because it's the construction of this machine that matters, a machine designed to take Mr. Aslan's life. And lay the blame firmly at the professor's door, something that could only have been carried out. By you, Mr. Enoch Drubber. Uh, uh, he freaks out now, but then he's gonna get a second win, and I'm gonna have to prove something again, and blah 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 blah. VR coasters are cool, but the real thing is way more fun. The thing about the VR coaster is, um, they also built the track to how it looks in the VR. It's just that you're wearing VR, like, a headset or something, and you're going on the coaster. So you're, like, if you th see yourself going up in the VR thing, you're actually going up in real life. You sound so excited for the rest of the trial. It's because I want to see if my hypothesis is correct. that it was the wax model in the balloon that crashed into the crystal tower and the real body was underneath the tower and i want to see how that gets solved i did a vr coaster at coney island once they have vr coasters at coney island whoa they're getting fancy if my learned friend has reached the end of his wild assertions and you you do that 
The prosecution would like to crush the defense's argument slowly, but surely. What? Their argument fails to hold water. No, it doesn't. On two counts. Two? Firstly, before and after the experiment, this witness went nowhere near the kinesis machine. Every relevant member of staff from the exhi exhibition has attested to that. Unless he wears a disguise! And I believe members of Scotland Yard have also been on watch duty at every public experiment. Disguise? In other words, Mr. Drebber had no opportunity to switch the alleged pair of bird cages. Because there were two different ones. But I've already explained why he wouldn't have needed to. The nonsense with the crossbow, that doesn't bolster your case at all. Why not? There was a crossbow found at the scene. The man who disappeared from stage and the man who crashed into the tower are one and the same. No, they're not. The other's a waxter. The forensic investigation team's report is unequivocal on that point. Then is someone lying to me? And the second flaw in your assertion is a distinct lack of motive. Money! Why would he? Why would this man have wanted to take the victim's life? He had no reason to do so. Money. <laughs> Motive? Do I have to think of everything myself? <laughs> Nano John, dear! Long time no see. Happy Monday. Hope you've been well, dude. What is that emote? Is that a golden cup with arms? That's kind of, kind of freaky. <gasps> I have here a contract provided by the witness. What contract is this, Lord Van Zeeks? The contract into which Mr. Drebber entered with the victim, Mr. Asman. It reads, Mr. Drebber is to receive 30% of all remunerations from government grants or, or other income. 30%? Certainly a favorable contractual conditions. But there was one very important provision bolted onto that clause. What provision? Mr. Drebber may only uphold this right on condition that both contracting parties are alive. In other words, if either of us were to die, the contract will become null and void. So you see, I had nothing to gain from Mr. Aslan's death. The diametric opposite, in fact. Uh... Still money! From someone else! <laughs> Need I say more? The witness had neither an opportunity nor a reason to commit the alleged crime. In short, the possibility of Mr. Drebber having done as you'd suggest is nil. It's not! Uh... Wow. Hey, good. Hope you are too. I am good. My family is coming to visit this Thursday, so I most likely won't be able to stream next week. But I'm going to Disneyland again. Is he not turtly enough for the Turtle Club? <gasps> turtles. I like turtles. Hmm. It seems the defense's assertion was somewhat uh what wide of the mark. I am right! I'm right! And in the end, when you find out I am right, I will hate you all and kick you all in the face. Lord Von Zeeks, you will submit the contract as evidence, please. Time to check it out. It's true! What's true? Investor Odious Man, Odious Man hereby enters into contract with providers, fund labors, and Mr. Drebber is to receive 30% of all remunerations from government grants or other income. Mr. Drebber may only uphold this right on condition that both contracting parties are alive. Hmm. Provider. Fund labor and materials. Okay. Uh, Koopas! Is that like a chibi version of the Elden Ring walking pot? Oh, yo, Elden, Weir Elden Ring has some weird monsters. Have a good time at Disneyland, that sounds fun. It's gonna be my fourth time going in the span of, like, let's see, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, in nine months. Oh, dang. Uh, if Trevor had no opportunity to switch the birdcage under the stage with the one in the Crystal Tower, he couldn't have done it, and in any case, I have no idea what his motive might have been. There's one aspect of your argument that still holds true, however. 
There were two bird cages. The prosecution is unable to deny that. Ah, so I'm sure you're on the right lines, Mr. Naruhodo. And I have no doubt there are other aspects of your assertion that are undeniable truths, too. Well, it would seem. But the defense has no rejoinder to offer. Caw, caw, caw. Well, I must say, I'm a little surprised. I came here to testify about the machine I built, and instead my reputation is defiled. Your reputation will still get defiled, don't worry. But the prosecution's counter has set the record straight, I think. It's impossible that I'm the culprit. You're not off the hook, I know you're guilty. At the beginning of this trial, we believed that there was only one birdcage, yet now we know there must have been two. In other words, there was more to the demonstration than we realized at first. I think it's abundantly clear that the same applies to the culprits. Get to the points. The stage demonstration was constructed and set up in, in its entirety by you, Mr. Drubber. Therefore, it's inconceivable that you had no hand in the events that transpired. So if circumstances being, it's impossible that you could have carried out the crime yourself, it points to the fact that someone else was involved. Someone else? Counsel, are you suggesting? Yes, my lord. Yeah. Ah! I skipped it! You heard about Crisis Core Reunion? No? What is that? How could there be a Crisis Core Reunion if Zack died? Sorry, spoilers. <laughs> Final Fantasy VII spoilers! Remaster? Oh, okay. Man, I don't know if I want that. Hmm. Because I like Crisis Core. It was fun on the PSP, but... Okay, he had an accomplice. Wow, spoilers. I'm sorry. <laughs> an accomplice now. Well then, I presume you're prepared for what's to come. They remodel everything ground up? Oh. Huh. Like, to be honest, I don't know if this is an unpopular idea, but I actually like the graphics of PSP era games. Like Final Fantasy Type-0, Parasite Eve, Third Birthday, Rice's Core, uh, Valkyrie Profile, the remake. I like the graphics and I wish they stayed like that. Like sometimes PS4 graphics, Kinda ugly. The people look too plastic. I don't like that. Looks good, but everything is still the same. Voices and dialogue. Oh, then... I don't know if I'll spend money on that. Because as much as I liked Zack, and Crisis Core was fun, I don't think I'll enjoy it, like, if it's on, um... Like, PS4, PS5. But, man, I gotta remind myself to look it up after stream. I want to see how they how they made it pretty. Uh, now that they're accusing not only this witness, but someone else of the most serious of crimes. If these accusations turn out to be false, then make no mistake. The prosecution will demand an equally serious punishment for your slander. Well, counsel, do you intend to pursue this course and formally accuse another party of involvement in this matter? What do I do here? At the moment, this is a little more than a on my part. Uh, what I do is I save. <laughs> I haven't played it since PSP, so I'm kind of hyped to play it again. I remember enjoying the music. I liked... I feel like the reason why I liked it so much on PSP was because I also liked, um... Like, the UI and the sound effects. I don't know if they're gonna keep exactly the same ones on PS4. Like, one of my favorite games just to, like, be on the menu and not play the game is, um, Metal Gear Peace... Is it Peace Walker? The one with Paz? Metal Gear PSP. Yeah, Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. I love it because I love the menu and the sounds. <laughs> if I could mod my, like, Windows computer to have those sounds, and my phone too, actually, to have that clicky sound whenever like I move things and like open things up. I would. Uh, they're gonna add something at the end of Crisis Core reunion. They're releasing it after showing off seven 
are part two, aka seven rebirth. Oh, okay. Speaking of PSP split, you hear about P3, P, P4, G, and P5R coming to Xbox and PC? Yes, I did. I hope everyone plays Persona 3 Portable and give it the love it deserves. Except, I will say, December sucks, but the rest of that game is so good. I'm just waiting for P4G to leave the PSP era for PS4, PS5. As much as I liked P Persona 4 when I played it, I'm just ready for it to like kind of kind of get quiet now because everyone loves the kids and they create so much like merch and content for it but i'm like eh, i'm tired of these kids you don't like persona 3 persona 3 is my favorite i love it persona 4 was my first persona game so i have a soft spot for it ah, okay it's my favorite into persona oh Okay, yeah, but like... Oh, you think FES is better than P3P? <sighs> ooh, ooh, I like the portable. <laughs> P4G is my first, that's why. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. No, Persona 3 Portable is where it's at because you get to control your party members and you get to play as a girl and date Akihiko. And that's why Persona 3 Portable is the best. <laughs> P4 sucks, the dungeons are lame. Mm, no, I think the dungeons are better than Persona 3. Because Persona 3 is just a tower. And basically all you do in Persona 3 is reach this checkpoint, the save point, and then just keep going down the stairs for like um items quest item farming for quests. And basically, if you know one layout, you know every layout. So, Persona 3's dungeon is kind of meh. Persona 4 are the long hallways. Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. Persona 4 does have the long hallways, and that gets annoying. I started with P3 but uh, first, but I didn't like it. I think I already told you my reason before. I think you said it. Yeah. Tartarus got boring so quick. It did, but it was so easy to grind. I don't know for sure if Jabber had an accomplice or even if he is really is the culprit here. One way or another though, I have to make my position clear as a lawyer. But what's my stance going to be? Did Jabber have an accomplice or not? Let's just say yes. Because I feel like they want me to say yes. The defense is ready to name Mr. Jabber's accomplice. Somehow the two bird cages must have been switched. Everything points to that. Yet according to the Carter's report, that's not a possibility. I wouldn't mind trying it out. Can I have your PSP? <laughs> I will say, Persona 5 Mementos is kind of like a longer Tartarus. So Mementos got boring, but the actual like dungeons when you're um, facing the, the shadows, those are fun. Those were interesting. Except when you got turned into a freaking mouse. <laughs> that was annoying. That inconsistency itself is a clue! Council. Hmm? My lord? You've received a stark warning already. If you are nevertheless determined, then I must ask you now to identify this alleged accomplice by name. So, your answer, please. Who do you claim to have been Mr. Drebber's accomplice? He's dead. Not him, not him. He's the victim. Shoot! Could that have been her? Cause she said her wax model was stolen. But she was ready to pay money for it. She hired Sholmes. They found it for her. Balloon guy, this kid. No, these two were up in the balloon. And they were in a different balloon. And the shot was coming from the ground. Mementos did get boring, but at least the music in Royal was better than the Tartarus music. Hey, at least the Tartarus music, whenever they reached different blocks, it got a little remix to make it a little snazzy. 
P5 was boring. I couldn't pick it up to play it again if it wasn't for the trophies. Hmm. I feel like it... It's... It's not, like, super boring. I feel like... Persona 5 had the best, like, team interactions. Like, they felt like kids. And they weren't as annoying as the P4 kids. I'm sorry. The P4 kids were a little too over the top. The artwork and the sound effect and battle system was good, but the characters weren't all that memorable for me. Ooh. I guess so, because they're, they're like, pretty toned down and mellow compared to the P4 cast. The P4 cast, I feel like, was made super vibrant and bubbly to like offset how like kind of gloomy and dreary Persona 3 was. But I I got to be honest, I don't like the P4 kids. Ah! <laughs> Carter's had better scenery though. Mm. Another popular opinion, I don't see why people like Chia the best. Risei was my favorite girl. Naoto for me. P4G had more content too until Royal came out. I guess it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. P Persona 3 Portable Forever for me. That's my number one. Doesn't matter, Raido Kuzunoha is the best. I still have to pick that up again. I really need to just play that like outside of streaming and just upload it to YouTube, but I've been busy. Who's the who's the thing? Who's the accomplice? I'm guessing it's either Madame to spells. I don't think it's either of them. Or... Would it be... The only reason why I think it might be Courtney Scythe is because randomly in the beginning of this trial, we got an autopsy report. And the name of the coroner was Courtney... Courtney something. So I'm wondering if Courtney Scythe changed her name and was also involved because because Drepper was involved in the professor case because he found the body. So it's like, could they... Are they siblings? I mean, they kind of look alike with the white hair. Sorry, did someone say Persona 5 Striker stream? I know, I have to finish Strikers too! I'll get to it, I'll do it, I must do it. I gotta save here, actually. Who should I say, who should I say was the accomplice? It's between Courtney Scythe or Madame Two Spells. Meeny miny mo, catch a tiger by the toe. If he hollers, let him go. My mother said to pick the best one, and you are it. Two spells? No, I'm gonna. No. Okay, let's just let's just. But we got that really weird coroner's report. I'm gonna- I'm gonna say Courtney Scythe. <laughs> the name of the person in question is? What's wrong, my Nipponese friends? Surely fear doesn't bind your tongue now. It's a little late for that. Of course I'm afraid. After all, naming her in this capacity is definitely going to make waves. A lot of waves. I could very well turn every single person in this courtroom against me. I'm sure it will be alright, Mr. Naruhodo. Thank you, Mrs. Sato. The enemy always appears larger than life, but you'll appear exactly the same to the enemy. Alright then, here goes. You've kept us waiting long enough. Your answer, Council. Now. The person who colluded with, with Mr. Drubber in order to carry out this wicked crime is Scotland Yard's coroner, Dr. Courtney Scythe. What, what the blazes are you talking about? Dr. Scythe! The head of the forensic investigation team and the coroner who conducted the autopsy on the victim. Am I going to get killed? 
You never finished Striker? I thought you did. It was free for download as a plus member. I tried it again outside the demo and drop it after 30 minutes or so. Musa just ain't it for me. I did not finish it. I'm still on the... I'm still on the second uh, case. The dude in Sendai. <laughs> I'm still all the way back there. After all these years. <laughs> we know there were two bird cages, so who could have carried out the switch to complete the illusion? The accident happened in front of a huge crowd of spectators, and the area was immediately sealed off. Then everyone, police officers included, were banished to make way for the forensic investigation team. When else could the switch have occurred? It can only have been in that team's presence. It's essential that the court determines exactly what happened following the incident. The defense demands that Dr. Scythe be summoned to the witness stand at once to testify. Is it really her? Is she really the accomplice? You've got a nerve, lad. Standing up there, dragging a the yard's name through the mud. I didn't mean to. I know the woman very well. There's no better dead room worker out there. How dare you call her a criminal! My learned friend's imagination appears to be wilder than the East End at night. Oh, so am I going to die? Is this over for me? Is the trial over? But the recklessness of your accusation aside, there's another grave problem with your arguments. One which the prosecution demands you address at once. A grave problem? But um, shh. Oh my word! Who do you claim acted as the victim's doppelganger? What? Hmm, certainly if the birdcage containing the body of the victim was exchanged for another. That cage must have also contained a body. And yet, no missing persons or accidental deaths of anyone even remotely resembling the victim ever were reported. The jury finds the defendant not guilty on all charges. <laughs> it's going to happen! I'm gonna get the not guilty verdict. I just have to get to the end. Which means there was not one, no one, dead or alive, who could have fulfilled the role of a body double for Mr. Asman. Uh, that's true. If my argument is that there were two bird cages, then there must also have been one person inside each. I know the answer. It's the body, it's the wax doll. I don't know if I got an answer to this yet, have I? I do! What can I do to reveal how this body double stunt was achieved? Present evidence! Very well, the defense will address my learned friend's concerns by presenting evidence that reveals the true nature of Mr. Asen's body double. Good gracious, evidence. I do hope this isn't filibustering, counsel. The court is expecting a name. If you think there are, you have relevant evidence, present it now. The body double and the birdcage were hiding inside the balloon that was floating above the stage, which means that any witness would have only seen them from 60 feet away. So who was it that appeared out of the explosion some 18 meters above the spectators? Aha! The body double inside the second birdcage was... I'm gonna save it here. Okay. Yeah. We know that the victim, Mr. Asman, was in the birdcage that was situated inside the kinesis machine on stage. And therefore he couldn't have been inside the second birdcage. Instead, that contained something else. What's been described as a body double, which is what fell from the sky and crashed into the crystal tower. Yes, counsel, according to your somewhat elaborate version of events. And that body double inside the second birdcage was, in fact... It's alright, Mr. Nadohoro. You're ready for this. Just steal yourself. And come out with it. Thank you, Mr. Sato. I needed that. As I was saying, the body double inside the second birdcage was... And um, as unbelievable as it seems, that thing there. When did we bring that? Who brought that here? Who brought this here?! Open your eyes and look into mine, my Nipponese friend. Oh, he's in love with me. Now tell me, what are you playing at? Stand firm now, Yunosuke. This is the time to show your Japanese spirit. As the court will observe, this is a waxwork model. A model, in fact, of an infamous London murderer from 10 years ago, the Professor. 
You started by indicting the leader of the forensic investigation team as an accomplice to this, in this crime. And now you've moved on to indicting Waxworks. Yes, that's about the size of it. But why? And why this Waxwork? It looks nothing like the victim. In fact, it could hardly resemble him less. What possible justification can you give? If you want to know why, ask Mr. Drubber. Because he stole the wax! What? Just days before Professor Hairbrain performed his public demonstration, Mr. Drebber abducted this model from Madame to Spells. Did, did you say abducted? And two days after the incident at the Great Exhibition, he returned it to the museum. Then, the timing. Is it true, Mr. Drebber? Uh, um... At first, I couldn't see why Mr. Drebber would have stolen the waxwork and then given it back again. But now the reason is clear. He took it so that he could put it inside the second birdcage as a body double for Mr. Asman. Ugh. Seriously, who brought that here? Stream is dropping, why? Twitch, what are you doing to me? I'm sorry this is happening. Wow, this is so annoying. Are you hearing this, ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Are you hearing the defense's astonishing proposal? That the witness fabricated this vast machine with the intention of deceiving some wretched scientist. That he did so in collusion with the country's finest coroner on a public stage in front of a vast audience. And that, to the effect, to effect the deception, he used a waxwork model that was in no, that in no way resembles the victim. No one can see the body clearly if it's far away. And if Courtney Scythe really is his accomplice, she can have the body switched. Like, what? Are we really to believe this far-fetched tale? What do you decide? Wait. Yes, if you put it like that, of course it sounds implausible. Bernard! I need to speak, if you please. Go ahead, Mr. Foreman. Myself and my colleagues have reached an agreement. Oh no, it's gonna be the pit the juror thing against each other thing. No! For the good in that case. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you will state your learnings for the court to hear now. Yuzai. 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 Blomp, 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 blomp. Use I. So, as indicated by the foreman, the jury has reached a consensus. I knew that was going to happen. We shall get through this, Mr. Nadahoro, as we always do. And uncover some new truths along the way, I'm quite sure. Yes, I agree. I'm going to have to appeal to the jurors as usual and see if I can persuade them to change their minds. Defense will now embark on a submission examination. I can't spell Japanese or German, I know. Um, I think the way you... <laughs> Wiener Schnitzel. <laughs> Actually, I don't remember how to spell Wiener Schnitzel. I'm not a real German student! Are you and your fellows ready to proceed, Mr. Foreman? We are, my lord! Very well! In that case, I ask you now to state clearly for all present to hear. The grounds on which each of you have decided that the defendant is guilty of the crime which he is charged. Wiener Schnitzel. I think for the Schnitzel, you just switch around the E and the L. That you put in, and the the Uzi, you just change the O to a U. Then I think that's it. I have no level of fear, you should not be accomplished to anything. It's sort of nonsense to think that the two would ever be conniving with one another. Oh dear, this is most troubling. But surely the waxwork is, the man stole has nothing to do with the coroner, is it? I've had my own problems with members of the police. I do not trust them much. I've seen no rigorous proof that this waxwork was ever inside the perk. It's conjecture. Accusing him without right evidence is it's not a proper job, is he? I won't have it. Who do I pit? Who do I pit? Somewhat unsurprisingly, it seems the introduction of this waxwork model to the proceedings has polarized opinion. Even that its face is obscured and its build in no way resembles that of the victim. I can only applaud my learned friend's temerity at suggesting it as Mr. Aswan's body double. Yes, the applause is deafening, and yes, I know it seems extraordinary. But that's the point. 
That's why I have a strong feeling it's actually a greater do clue than any anyone re yet realizes. Blah, blah, blah. What are you thinking, Mr. Naruhoda? I can't explain why it at the moment, but I feel as though there's a specific reason why it was used. Why it had to be this model. Really? A reason why nothing else would do, you mean? Yes, and I'm convinced it's something far more significant than whether or not the model looked like the victim. Well, if that's the case, we must prevent the trial from ending prematurely at all costs. Why it had to be that model? Did they want to bring attention to the professor case again? Yes, agreed. I have to find a way out of this. My biceps are super sore because I started working out again and I'm dying. If you're ready, counsel, you may proceed with the summation examination. Yes, my lord. Leon Dr Dreisaitl? Is he a hockey player? Ripped toast. I don't think I'll ever get rips because I don't lift weights and um, uh, I don't watch what I'm eating. I eat everything. Like, I don't care about eating healthy or eating leaner meats. Like, I'm here to enjoy the food. I'm working out because I don't want my heart to be weak because I'm sitting like a lot every day. I don't want to get a heart attack. Is that a nonsense to think these two would ever be conniving with one another? My dad is most trembling. Uh, I'm gonna press you. Why would you assume that? Well, quite simply because that unsettling swindle has no relationship with the woman, does he? True, as it stands, we don't know of any connection. Oh gosh, but it would be delightfully romantic if they were somehow to have a mutual interest in the waxwork. Romantic? A woman of society such as myself views everything in terms of relationships, you know. Well, you learn something new every day, even if you don't want to. One might wonder about possible relationship between the defendant and this coroner woman. Or perhaps between the defendant and the handsome prosecutor just there. This woman may be more astute than I've been giving her credit for. If that's the woman's stance, then perhaps demonstrating some connection between the waxwork and Dr. Scythe would be enough. Yes, I agree. As soon as we have even a whiff of a connection, she'll be the first to know. Juror number one also wanted to see that they had a connection. So let's press him. Grandma, it's okay. No! Healthy toast, that sounds like a real thing. I feel like it is, just like a very, like, like, protein, veggie, conscious toast. I really shouldn't eat more salads, but... I don't like salad! Toast, um, from whole wheat bread. Hmm, yeah. Whole wheat, or what's the other good one? Was it rye or pumpernickel? I think one of them is also good. But I don't know. But we're only just starting to understand this case! What are you reading there, sir? The man behind those murders on Solar Pond Street was caught in two days flat. That's real policing for you. That's really not relevant to this case, is it? You're wrong there. Because it was Dr. Scythe in charge of examining the bodies. There was evidence arising from her work that led to the arrest of the scoundrel responsible. Oh. That's right. Oh, that woman is at the forefront of this country's fight against crime. The idea that she's somehow involved in this murky business is a load of old tosh. I thought it was up to me to press the jurors, not the other way around. Okay, so not him. Uh, press. What sort of problems? Let's just say we have run into each other on numerous occasions while I've been performing on the street. Right, I see. Obviously, artists such as myself cannot appear on stage as we work in close proximity to our audiences. We perform our great magic in parks, on street corners and the like. But the police use any excuse to make our lives difficult. You wanna... What you say about that? Do you have something to say in response to that, Mr. Honormole? Who are you calling a mass murderer? Ah, sorry, my mistake. I got confused because I heard you look like him. I don't look anything like the man. You wanna be locked up, sonny? Thanks, Mr. Sholmes. Perhaps we could move on. I was really wondering if you had something you wanted to add in response to what the juror number three just said. Don't swing your gun around like that, please. And clearly you do. Back in my day, back in the good old days. It wasn't like this. What was it like, sir? We worked our fingers to the bone to earn the public's trust we did. And by jail we entered, people respected us back then. Respected you? Hmm. 
No one would have called the coroner into question in them days. The coroner's report was a hallmark of an investigation done right. And then people got educated. Especially when Dr. Courtney Stevens put a name to it. You're the best of the best and the apple of the force's eye. Hold on a minute. What are you talking about? Who's Courtney Stevens? Ah, sorry, got a bit carried away there. Stevens is Dr. Sight's maiden name. Her maiden name? But that was before she was married. Of course, yes, yeah, silly me. It's Scythe now, isn't it? Stevens. I'm sure I've seen that name somewhere recently. Anyway, the point is, those were the great days of policing. Not like now. Not to interrupt, sir. But do you think you could change your statement to include that name? Well, yes, I don't see why not. Here's Courtney Stevens back then. I knew her, of course, a legendary coroner even then. Let's press this. She was legendary, was she? What do you say? Ah! That woman still the best coroner in the land, head of the forensic investigation team. Um, legendary wasn't your description, sir, not mine. Rubbish, that one word never passed my lips. I never describe anybody that way, ever! Not if they're still in the game. Excuse me. I think the point you're trying to make is that Dr. Scythe is an extremely talented coroner, would that be fair? It would, if it weren't for the fact that you're trying to drag that legendary rev woman's reputation through the mud. I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that legendary. So now we have a connection because... But is it listed in the evidence that they're connected? Uh, cause... This autopsy report... They don't know that, um, in the display it's... It's Drebber... At the grave. Did I examine this? Is there more to be found here? Nothing's, like, getting highlighted. The head's upside down. Yeah, there's nothing else we could examine. Oh! Open it! Open it! Can't find anything out of place? What do you mean? Unlatch the helmet! Okay. Um... Oh! The camera around the neck? Is there something I could examine here? <gasps> Blood! <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I throw it. What a wonderful machine! You really love contraptions like this, don't you? Oh yes, anything mechanical I find absolutely irresistible. Almost irresistible, surely. Well, whenever I see a pocket watch, for example, I can't help myself. I simply have to take it apart. That's worrying. Yes, Father tells the time by the rumblings of his stomach now. He's given up on having a watch. Or Professor Mikotoba. Blood! Look, Mr. Nadohoro. What is it? On the bellows just here. There seems to be blood, whatever. Yes, you're right. It looks like blood, actually. Oh, oh my. I'm sure it's not what you're thinking. Ha 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 ha. Dark staining is visible on the bellows. Is there no film in here? Oh, look, the cover came open. Yes, now, there should be a glass plate inside. You have to change the plate with each new photograph you want to take, you see? Is something wrong? There's no plate. It's been removed. Ah, what a pity, but I suppose if you think about it, this wouldn't be the actual camera that was used at the time, just like the waxwork isn't the actual person. So we never have found a photographic print of the ex executed convict coming back to life anyway. Oh, yes, you're quite right, of course. Poor Susatotan, she looks devastated. So there's no film. So all we got is that blood stain. Okay. The sight of blood causes an allergic reaction and coughing. That's new. It just shocked me. This piece of glass is almost as thick as it is wide. Yes, I've never seen anything like it. If you were to compare it to a human, only Mr. Sholmes has such thick skin. There's really no need for such a comparison, Mr. Naruhodo, as you well know. Anyway, it can only be from the Crystal Tower, surely. Yes, I think so too. It was probably made especially to meet the demands of the great structure. Okay. Um... Hmm. Blah blah blah. Uh, I've seen no, no rigorous proof. But you claim the whole instantaneous kinesis demonstration was a trick. That I did, but there's more than one way to pull a rabbit out of a hat, isn't there? Sorry? I grant you, given that this cage appeared from amidst an explosion, there'd have been no need to use a real person. 
But if a waxwork has been used, a culprit could at least have the decency to make it look like a victim. Not sh sure exactly how much criminals are governed by decency. Point is, if you're going to make a claim about that waxwork being inside the birdcage, you need to give us some evidence. Without that, it's not just science. I suppose we should expect nothing less than a logical argument from a fellow of the Royal Society. But that perhaps means his mind could be changed if we manage to present suitable evidence. Evidence that Professor Waxwork was inside that birdcage, I have evidence. Actually, I have something I'd like you to see, sir. Oh, I must warn you that I firmly believe it's only wise to trust men in white coats. Like psychiatrists? You give me your jet black outfit, I don't mind admitting to a sense of trepidation here. So you don't trust anyone in black. Look in a mirror. Looking in a mirror must be very trying. But he's dumb, so his logic doesn't make sense. So I do have some evidence. It is the piece of glass. I was going to redeem hydrate, but not enough. <laughs> it's okay. <clears throat> I feel my throat being scratchy, so I will hydrate soon. What's that? A piece of glass? Though it's unusually thick for glass. Yes, it's a piece of broken glass that we found inside the jacket on the waxwork. As you say, it's not ordinary glass, though. It's very thick and clearly made for extra strength. Much like the special glass that was developed for the construction of the Crystal Tower. Crystal Tower. Holy smoke! Exactly. The centerpiece of the great ex- ex- blah, 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 I can talk. Exhibition, or the very incident we're talking about, took place. On the day in question, the birdcage fell from above and smashed through a window of that special glass. From whence the small piece originated, is that it? Precisely. So what do you say? Now that clear evidence in support of the assertion has been placed before you. Well, as I said, I only trust men in white coats as a rule. However, when the reasoning is sound, it's fair to say color shouldn't come into it. In light of what you've shown me here, yes, I feel obliged to change my position on the matter. In that case, you're number four. You will amend your statement now, please. Ah, oh, man, golden, redeem the hydrate. Ugh. I took two sips. I had 34k points, now 24k. <laughs> the presence of that piece of glass. Accusing someone of that right evidences is not a proper job. Okay, now I think I pit number four against five. Uh, to be safe, I'm gonna save. Wow, I'm saving a lot today. Is it one of us up? Okay. You! I have evidence now. Those two statements clearly contradict each other! Oh gracious! To whose statements do you refer to? Oh, did I do it wrong? If you could put down your corner moment, juror number five. Ooh, you mean me? You've pointed out that it's wrong to make an accusation without evidence. But the accusation that the waxwork model was inside the second birdcage on the day in question is not without supporting evidence, as the defense demonstrated to the juror sitting beside you. Ooh, is that right? Would it be fair to say? You didn't follow the arguments. I don't understand much besides Colonel Cobb, to be honest. Of course you don't. Why is there a child on the jury? If I could interject here. Please do, sir. Now that this assertion of yours about the waxwork has been backed up by some solid evidence, it would be wrong with me as a man of science not to pursue the matter further. Hooray! Ah, well, me too then. Sorry? If this brain gentleman says right, it must be. See, I um I wouldn't dream of going against Colonel Cobb or anyone who's got something between the ears. Now who are the other two that I have to pit? Success! If you can call it that. Hmm, you're done. I have my own problems with the police, I don't trust them much. The wax or the mantle has nothing to do with the coroner. Utter nonsense to think the two would ever be conniving with one another. There's Courtney Stevens back then. I knew her, of course, a legendary coroner even. I bet she would listen to corn. Ha ha ha! Okay, you know what? Sorry, I'm cheating. I have no idea who to pit. Um. Pass. Okay. Okay. That's weird. Hmm. I pit juror number two, juror number six. 
Those two statements clearly contradict each other. Good gracious. To whose statement do you refer, counsel? So, juror number two. Of course, me. What can I do for you? I presume that you heard what juror number six said in the statement. It's brought to light the maiden name of the coroner, Dr. Scythe, which in turn has revealed a connection that wasn't apparent before. Well, naturally, as a woman of society, I find such connections and relationships irresistible. But dear golly, I'm afraid I fail to see what you mean. Dr. Scythe's maiden name is Stevens, and through that name, the coroner is very definitely linked to the waxwork of the killer. The defense has evidence to prove it. My goodness, evidence, you say? How, how utterly enthralling. Counsel, the court cannot overlook that last remark. I very much hope there is substance to your claim. Of course, my lord. I would ask the court to look at this. The evidence that clearly links Dr. Scythe to the mass murderer known as the Professor. Does everyone know this is the Professor Waxwork? Is that what I was missing? Whatever. I have here a certain autopsy report from 10 years ago. A 10 year old autopsy report? What relevance does that have? It is of course from the autopsy of the person portrayed in the waxwork, the killer known as the Professor. The professors? But the man was a capital offender, so... That's right. This is the certification of death that was drawn up after the convict's execution. The identity of the killer was never made public, so the report gives few details. But what's important is the name of the coroner who wrote it. Courtney Stevens. Oh my! Courtney Stevens! Sparkle light! It appears that the professor's autopsy was conducted by Dr. Scythe ten years ago. And a few days ago, Mr. Drebber very deliberately stole the waxwork of the professor from Madame to Spells. A waxwork that doesn't, in fact, resemble the victim, Mr. Asman, at all. And do you suppose there's some unsavory relationship between those events? Absolutely. I'm sure of it. There's no doubt in my mind that the professor case is at the heart of a link that we have yet to uncover. Between Dr. Courtney Scythe and Mr. Enoch Drebber. Was he- is Drebber trying to frame Courtney Scythe? Hidden links, mysterious connections, secret relationships. This is all most extraordinary. We're surely obliged now to explore this further. I don't- Why would they be a comp- Quite right, we can't just let this crowd come to an end now. Oh, well, there's this cloud of suspicion hanging over the yard's best corner. It wasn't like this in my day, but we're still here to uphill justice in the end. I keep changing his voice. I can't get it down. I guess that's what we're going to try to find out, huh? How they're connected, why they're connected. Thank you, counsel. That will do. As a result of the submission examination, the jury's overall leading has changed. Two jurors now call guilty, against four who call not guilty. Accordingly, the court has failed to reach a consensus at this time. And the trial must continue. We did it! Oh, well done, Mr. Nadhoro. Another wonderful victory. Objection! No objection? Okay. Go with it. You voice every time. I will. Hmm, a waxwork of the despicable professor. Used as a body double for the victim in this quite extraordinary case. I must say, it's extremely hard to believe the assertion could possibly be true. However, it would appear that it does at least warrant further investigation. It's a waxwork of the professor that links Mr. Drebber and Dr. Scythe. And I'm convinced that there's a special significance to that link. I don't know what you're hoping to prove, lad, I don't. The truth, sir, by using evidence and testimony. Hmm. If the court is to delve deeper into the alleged involvement of the waxwork in this case, then the prosecution calls for the owner of the model to be summoned as a witness. The owner? Madame to spells. I really thought that Lord Van Zeeks would object to this whole line of inquiry. But well, I concur. Make arrangements for Madame to spells to appear as a witness, with immediate effect. Listen carefully, my learned friend. Oh, yes? You should know that you're on the brink of opening Pandora's box. Of what? <laughs> the court shall now adjourn for 45 minutes. During that time, the prosecution will summon the new witness and prepare her for taking the stand. 
Madame to spells, yes. I shall see to it at once, my lord. To be continued, but I'm just gonna go ahead. I wanna finish the trial. I need to see how it ends. I'm thinking it's gonna be late. But I'm thinking maybe in August I'll play the quarry for Spooky Summer. Because I need to finish up other games before I start that. Ah, <laughs> oh, the Knight's Errant himself! Oh, have you been watching from the gallery, Mr. Scholes? I've been on the edge of my seat the entire time. Courtroom trials are fascinating affairs, as a spectator at least. I'm glad you've been enjoying yourself. I, I have to ask, what on earth is going on? It makes no sense! What's this professor's business about? He doesn't look at like a professor I've ever met before! Who even is he? Ah, of course. You were in Germany already ten years ago. Yes, the professor. When I discovered he was the one who had been abducted, a sense of foreboding stirred within me. But who knew the monster could come knocking at me a door? My heart felt sympathies! <laughs> As it turns out... Lord Van Zeeks is even more intimately tied to this case than any of us realized, isn't he? Yes, how true. His great friend from university in the dark. And now a waxwork of the killer who took his esteemed brother's life makes an appearance too. I imagine even the shrewd Mr. Reaper failed to foresee that kick in the teeth. An extraordinary move on your part, my dear fellow, to throw that in front of the man. Make it sound deliberate. I can't help feeling... That this professor case is really very puzzling. Oh yes? In what particular manner? Well, there's Mr. Trevor, Dr. Scythe, and Lord Van Zeeks. It seems that everybody in the trial has a link to the case somehow. Yes. In fact, I alone am not a member of the set. Now that leaves me as an empty set, all alone with no intersection to any other. Any other, blah blah. Dream has only been up for 25 minutes, gonna be honest, I kinda hate Holmes. <laughs> I have a feeling, like, in the last case, he's gonna, like, change personas and be totally serious. And be like, hey, do you know Skiff? Figure out the mystery. You gotta do it. I have a feeling that's gonna happen. Excuse me. Ah! Dr. Scythe! Ah, oh, Dr. Courtney Scythe, nay Stevens. Good day to you. Hello, Sholmes. That was very shrewd of you. What in particular, pray? You requested that ten-year-old autopsy report from Dr. Gregson. Uh, Dr. Gregson, didn't you? Why would you assume such a thing? Because Gregson told me. Do you think it's been ten years? Ten years in the laboratory, wielding my scalpel. The smell of nothing but corpses and disinfected. Disinfectant. A policeman on jury had a lot to say about you as it happens, Dr. Scythe. And I've accused you of being complicit in what happens. I'm hoping that you'll take the stand and tell the truth about what really happens. That certainly won't be possible. Lord Van Zeeks won't be summoning me as a witness. Lord Strongheart has forbidden it. Lord Strongheart? The Pandora's box you are warned about is the Professor case. But please don't make the mistake of thinking you'll get any information about it out of me. But attempting to hide from the truth, that's cowardice! I've already fought crime in the way that I see fit. I have no regrets, none at all. And that's all I came to say. So, good day to you. So, we won't be... cross-witnessing her? Okay. She mentioned it too, this Pandora's box. Whatever does it all mean? There's really no cause for concern. I assure you, when the trial resumes, the meaning will become all too apparent, whether you'd like it to or not. Huh? Now then, I believe it's almost time. I must make my way back to the public gallery. The edge of my seat awaits. I think maybe you're enjoying yourself a little too much. Ah yes, one word of warning before I go. If in the course of the trial this afternoon you perceive even a shadow of doubt about the truth, don't let it out of your sight. Pursue it like a dog with a bone. To the bitter end, you understand. Do not falter. Whatever may come to pass. Alright, I understand. Thank you. 
uh, change change your personas from Robin Hood to Loki. Yep, yep. I feel like that's gonna happen. Good. I shall make myself scarce then. I purchased a bar of caramel earlier, so I shall be gnawing on that as you gnaw away the truth. Rip stream. Again? Why? What did that warning from Mr. Sholmes really mean, I wonder? Especially the bit about whatever may come to pass. I want to unmask the professor. It's time for the final chapter then. I'm determined to find the truth. No matter what. You should have chat up on the screen. I do! I have two screens up. Dig it, 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 dig it. In the name of Her Majesty the Queen, I hereby reconvene the proceedings of this court. Councils for defense and prosecution, are you ready and able to continue? The prosecution is ready, my lord. Yes, my lord. The defense is also ready. As the court is aware, the case under our scrutiny began with a damaging incident at the Great Exhibition. Yet we now find ourselves embroiled in the details of a convicted felon who was sent to the gallows a decade ago. This trial has certainly defied all expectation. As seems to be the fate of all trials in which this Nipponese is involved, my lord. So then, let us begin our exploration of the defense's assertion that the waxwork was cardinally involved in this matter. Lord Van Zeeks, my lord, are we still awaiting the arrival of Madame Two Spells? Not at all. He is in the antechamber as we speak and ready to be summoned. Very well, bring in the witness! And then up on stream. Oh! I feel like I don't have sufficient space to like have the chat up. Unless I have it cut into the like... Cut into the game screen. At once, my lord. Or else I can't really show like too many lines of chat. Bailiff, show Madame two spells to the stand. Actually, let me try that. Can I edit it now? Things are about to become a lot more intense. If Trevor is responsible, as I'm sure he is, it means he must have had an accomplice, Dr. Scythe. And what connects the pair of them is the waxwork. Yes, the model of the professor. Personal uh, uh... alert box, no. After stream label, no. Um, ah, widgets, chat box, that sort. That sort. Chat box. Oh gosh, it's so tiny. Okay, you could try, try, chatting now. Move your chibi up and have it between you and the chibi. Um. Or I guess I could move the chibi down and have the chat just like up above that, but I'll try that for next time. But I have the chat box up now. I don't know if it'll work, so you can try chatting again. That's the key to the link between these otherwise unrelated individuals. It's a tenuous link admittedly, but at present it's all we have to go on. Oh gosh, he's making sholms. State your name and occupation for the court, please. My name is Madame Esmeralda to Spells. I am a waxwork artisan. I'm the proprietor of the Madame to Spells Museum of Waxwork. You will have to pardon me for working as I testify. My new exhibit must open very soon. Oh, so he finally gets a statue, does he? Now there are two of them in the world. Oh my, what expression is she carving onto that face? A number of days ago, a particular waxwork model was stolen from your museum. Can you confirm this? We, oui, that is true. At first, we believed it had been kidnapped. A waxwork model kidnapped? Yes, my lord. There was a demand for ransom money left behind by the culprits. However, according to what I have just been told outside the courtroom, that was not the true reason. I understand it was utilized as a substitute for the body of a murder victim. At present, that, that is no more than conjecture proposed by the defense. I wonder who she's chiseling. Oh no, the chat isn't coming up. Weird. Hmm. Oh wait. It's going from the bottom. Oh gosh. 
but then, oh, man, I don't want to have it climb up too much. Okay, wait, settings, uh, theme clean, uh, background color, four messages. Yeah, okay. Okay, so it'll like kind of like cut into my game screen, but whatever. Hey, lovey. This girl sets uh, up the most obvious of jokes. Uh, this is the victim of the case in question, Mr. Lodiusman. But of course, I know him well. He is part of my odious personages exhibit. French toast. Oh gosh, it's so small though. This chat window sucks. <laughs> I detest to say what is evident, but Mr. Asman does not resemble the professor at all. Yes, but perhaps... Perhaps their faces are very similar! Actually, what if I change this to, like, come on, on top? How do I change it? Font settings, chatter... Source... Mm. I don't know how to have it start from the top. Oh... Eh, this sucks. Are you suggesting that we should now see the demasked visage of the professor? I have here the key, but it is strictly forbidden to open the lock. This is absurd! Cardon? I don't know what face you've carved onto your fancy figure beneath that mask. But clearly it won't be that of the actual killer. Indeed. The man's identity was never made public after all. The trial took place in the closed court. The proceedings were strictly confidential. The condemned man was summarily executed. His identity remains a closely guarded national secret. There is no possible way that a repository of tawdry exhibits could get its hands on that information. Que dommage. It would seem you are unaware of the dispel's principles. What principles? Yeah, it's like cutting into... I guess it's my, um... My Streamlabs theme, that it looks like this, but eh, I don't know how to change it right now, so... Unless I make it super tiny, move it here, so that you can't read what anyone's saying. <laughs> the family of Tuspels has always prided itself on sculpting its models a la perfection. Every detail, including the visage, is fashioned with complete fidelity. Et voila, our principles. There's a well-known- I pushed that too fast. There's a well-known legend about the Tuspel's waxwork from the time of the French Revolution. A member of the Tuspel's family is said to have made a waxwork of the queen who was executed. Oui, that is true. It was a century ago now. I believe the queen's face was carved into the- in the minutes following her death, actually at the guillotine site. You are correct. The model is on display still today in the House of Horrors. We two spells will stop at nothing to obtain a faithful replica of our subjects. Dear me, a somewhat disturbing tenacity of purpose. Move your face to the top right, half chat, and bottom right. Uh, I guess so, for now. Wait, why do you, why do you want to see chat on... <laughs> I'm turning it off. <laughs> the only way to obtain a truly lifelike representation of the subject. I'll figure out the placement of chat and, like, how it shows up later, but right now, I'm... And it has been my family's secret for generations. Do you mean to say that beneath that mask? We, oui, the true visage of the killer is there. This is ludicrous. It's out of the question. Okay, we're not supposed to focus on the identity of this wax museum. We're supposed to incriminate Drubber. The professor spread terror throughout Great Breton. As a result, the Madame Tuspel's special exhibit remains extremely popular even today. The killer, emerging from his own grave, the sight to behold, you should come. I think, Madame, it would be beneficial to hear your formal testimony on this matter. You will explain every detail of this macabre model, and your personal involvement in its creation. With pleasure. The special exhibit in the House of Horrors is based on a rumor that shocked society in London. An impression of the visage was taken directly from the corpse in accordance with Tuspel's family principles. I enlisted the aid of the Grail Diver and created a mold for the head in the cemetery just before the interment. I ate myself until he gave me a signal. I was there for a very long time that night. As dawn approached, I was very worried that I could be discovered. 
Oh, so Drebber is the gravedigger. The gravedigger? The man sanctioned this. We? Oui. I will do all that is necessary to achieve the true resemblance my family is celebrated for. Nobody else knew, only the gravedigger. What harm did it do, huh? So you truly saw it? The face of that monster. Naturally. I was aware at the time that his identity was a secret. But his spells would not be to spells if we did not insist on absolute fidelity to our sculptures. Don't believe this. Whoops, that was antics. I myself have seen the special exhibit at your museum, madam. A truly blood-curling scene in which the murderer is emerging from his own grave. The scene it depicts was the subject of many rumours in London ten years ago. I have here a newspaper from the time. The special exhibit was based on upon the picture in this article. It was the most detailed account of what happened as reported by the eyewitness who saw it. Mr. Drebber, yeah, and it has, says his name on it. Mad Sheep Rampage! Man rises from the grave. It's too absurd for words. And now I examine it. Was the ball mask to blame for the Great Blaze? The Great Sink Parliament is finally dressed to foul issue. Charles Darwin to receive Copley Medal. Mad Sheep Rampage. Other slave phenomenon grips Oxfordshire region. Mr. Drep. <gasps> That's how they're connected. The public enjoy absurdity, Monsieur. Monsieur? That's why I've reproduced the scene as carefully as possible in my museum. And it's a whackworks from that exhibit that was stolen some days before the incident at the Great Exhibition, wasn't it? That's correct. The professor. Ah! The professor you see before you here. Hmm, most puzzling. Council for the Defense, proceed with the cross examination. This waxwork links Drebber to Dr. Scythe. And there is to be some reason for that, which hasn't yet come to light. But I'll find it. I'll get to the bottom of what really happens. I'll prove that Dr. Scythe and Drebber were in on this crime together. Flexible exhibit, rumor that shocks the side of London. Impressive take the in front of corpse. I enlisted the aid of Gregor and created a mold for the head. I hid myself until I gave a signal. I was there for a very long time that night. I was very worried I could be discovered. So Odie Odious Man, his signature is there, so he had to create the photo, but Drebber also had a camera. <laughs> no, his name is Odious Man. Um I didn't mess off until he gave me a signal. I'll press this. Surely that's legal, isn't it? It would seem the proprietors of this repository of novelties was blinded by monetary greed. It had nothing to do with money. The man is part of London's criminal history. That is why I had to sculpt him to record this history. It is a raison de Raison d'etre? Yeah? Of the Dispels Museum. But if the man was conv convicted in a close court and sent for immediate execution, then surely nobody but the members of the judiciary present know the killer's true identity. I assure you, behind that mask is hidden the true face of the professor. Do you realize what you're saying? The professor's identity is a national secret. I understand. And now that the truth shell about the special exhibit has been revealed, it must perhaps close. Of course it will. As will your entire museum if you don't tread very carefully, madam. That could be another interesting chapter in the history of my family, I think, don't you? So ten years ago, on the night of the professor's execution, you took a wax impression of his face from the corpse. Oui, exactement. Ah, you thought I said that? No, his name is Odie. Like, um. Oh, I can't show people's faces, but that's his name. Who exactly is. You were there longer than you expect to be. I had some difficulties in capturing the subject's form correctly. As I removed the mask, the mouth of the cadaver fell open and I had some problems with the chin. 
Dare I ask? The man has been dead for a short while already, you see. His muscles were relaxing and consequently his chin would not align itself correctly. Oh dear, what a horrible thought. Under normal circumstances, I would have had an assistant with me. However, that night I was alone, and as a consequence, I missed my preferred window of time. Yeah, but there were three people! This is fishy. What do you mean? When I take, when I take the impression of the visage of a cadaver, I always wait at three hours until, until three hours after death. Why three hours? Is that amount what? Is that amount of time significant? It is because of rigor mortis. A uh, Wrigley mortis? <laughs> it's the name given to a phenomenon that occurs in recently deceased bodies. As a rule, three hours post death, the muscles in the body begin to stiffen. By approximately 10 hours post death, the entire body is completely rigid and inflexible. And then from that point on, the muscles slowly start to revert to their relaxed state. The effect is often used to estimate the time of death when a body is discovered. Well, that was an education, if a slightly scary one. As the mademoiselle says, uh, rigor mortis commences three hours after death, and it starts in the jaw. I see, so that's why you wait. Before that time, the mouth falls open, and it is very difficult to do my work. Ugh, it's getting hard for me to do my work with all this talk of corpses. Hmm, I wonder about that information the corpse just heard from Madame's spells. It's significant! But she said she would have an assistant, she was alone. But if everything is right, then there's three people. Od odious man, Drebber, and her. Um, the information about rigor mortis that you just shared with us. Would you mind including it in your formal testimony? I believe it could be significant, you see. Of course, I do not mind at all. I can't help feeling that after this latest topic, the atmosphere in the courtroom has become extremely grave. This is no time for jokes, Mr. Sato. Madame, kindly amend your testimony as discussed. Yes, sir. It took me a very long time because it was before the onset of rigor mortis. So, she. So, if this autopsy report is correct, midnight in June, so they were there until 3 in the morning. At Lowgate Cemetery, just behind the prison, on the night of that foul demon's execution, a newly entered professor forced off his grave cover as he clawed free of the earth. A young man who witnessed the scene was on the verge of raising a shriek when, in the next seconds, a gunshot rang out suddenly from behind. The bullet pierced the resurrected man's chest, whose breath then stilled once more. The youth then finally released the scream he had been holding and ran for his life. The university student who experienced this shocking event is Mr. Enoch Drebber, a disciple of science at the University of London and a resident of the student. Why is this rigor mortis important? I should press this again, maybe. Rigor mortis being the phenomenon you described whereby the corpse becomes stiff after death. I think you said that it starts at the jaw about three hours post-death, is that right? What? This up? Of course, the exact duration depends a little on the season. I didn't realize a waxwork artisan would be so well-versed in the subject. Oh no, there's only elementary knowledge in the fields of legal medicine. Oh, I didn't mean to press that. Well, I had no idea about it, but maybe I won't admit to my ignorance about forensic science. Hmm, I could ask my father to give you a very simple primer if you like. I think corpses should be your domain. I'm not good with them. Oh dear, I'll do my very best. For a second when you said rigor mortis, I thought you said Rick and Morty. <laughs> As Dawn approached, I was worried I could be discovered. You say that dawn was approaching. What was the time of day then, approximately? Well, I could not say. But when I left the cemetery with my utensils and wax, the morning light was becoming visible. The execution took place on the 17th June, which had the earliest sunrise of that year. Indeed it did. First light would have been around 4.40 in the morning. That is really is early. 
The fact is, I had very little time, so I finished my work in half an hour. It was necessary to complete the impression and bury the body before daybreak, of course. If somebody had discovered me there, it would have been a catastrophe, so I had to hurry. Is it me, or does Mr. Sholmes seem to be taking shape more quickly now, too? Hmm, you certainly appear to go to extraordinary lengths for your work, madam. I wonder, is what she said particularly significant? Yes, because it denotes how long she was there. Madam, those details about how long it took you to complete the sculpture in the early sunrise, could you include them in your testimony? I believe they may be significant. Of course, if you'd like me to. You're quite right, Mr. Nadahoro, it is intriguing. A sunrise at four in the morning would be absolutely unimaginable at home, wouldn't it? That's not quite what I meant by significant. Pardon me amend your formal testimony then, ma'am. With pleasure, my lord. Heard to finish my work in the half hour before sunrise, and left as soon as the corpse was interred. So... She finished at 4.10. Pass it again. Did you have reason to believe you might be discovered once the sun came up or something? It pays a great difficult money, money to keep my little secret, of course. But with the morning light, I knew that the warden from the prison would commence his patrol of the area. Couldn't you have paid off the warden too, then? I have already paid the gravedigger, as I said. You cannot buy the silence of everyone, or is the secret is no longer a secret, huh? The sunrise was at 4.40 a.m. that day. Which means that it would have been around 4 when you began sculpting your work. We? Oui, that must be correct. That would be when the Graveseeker gave me the signal to come out of hiding. So that's all I've got to go on. What's your feeling, Mr. Nadohodo? For some reason, Dr. Scythe went along with Jebber's plan. Now, if that's really true, then the Professor is the only thing we know of that links the pair of them. So I feel sure that waxwork must be included as mystery somehow. In that case, we must use this cross-examination to uncover exactly what it means. Otherwise, the jurors are sure to revert their learnings and the trial will be over. I agree, but interestingly, uncovering what the professor had to do with all of this means more to Lord Van Seeks than anyone. That's the impression I'm getting anyway. Yes, as do I. After all, he has profound connection to the professor as well. Okay, what if... What if... Okay, so I thought that Drebber was Madame's assistant because he shows up in the photo. But what if she really was alone? That, um, that maybe Odious Man was there first, and he's the gravedigger, and, and Drebber just went there because he wanted to examine the corpse. I don't know. Working at 4 a.m., that's what I call it rough. Yeah, I... In college, I only worked the graveyard shift twice, and that was from, like, midnight to 6 a.m. and I wanted to shoot myself. It was the worst. I just noticed she's hot AF. <laughs> um, did I press this? Is that true of every waxwork in your museum then? It is, assuming the subject is dead of course. Life subjects have to cooperate in a similar way. I have letters from imprisoned criminals all the time, you know. What sort of letters? When my time comes, please make a waxwork of me. Come, ça. No! My museum is famous, monsieur. We made it to a waxwork as an honor, and for some criminals, a symbol of status, even. Because nothing says hardened criminal better than wax. And it is thanks to one killer in particular that my museum has gained such popularity in London. I refer to the star of this special exhibit, of course, the Professor. Whose form you claim to have captured by taking an impression from the actual corpse. There are no exceptions of the principles of two spells. Shoot yourself in the head. That's how you get a Greek god to appear and attack your enemies. <gasps> That's how you get Caesar to show up. Hmm. <laughs> it's the end of Gravedigger. Took me a long time before the onset of rigor mortis. I feel like I have to present the newspaper somewhere. Or is that not now? What could I possibly present to her? The head? No. The camera? Because it had blood on it. But whose blood? Mm, 
Okay, sorry. I'm really confused. I need to cheat. Uh. Okay, so it's this one, and I present the article. Weird. This one's really confusing. Nope! Okay, not nah, I lied. No! And I used a walkthrough and I got it wrong! Wait. Oh, okay. Wait, um... After that, present at statement four. Oh, I presented the wrong thing. Ha 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 It's the autopsy. <laughs> Madam Two Spells. I have here an autopsy report that was filed ten years ago now. It confirms the death of the professor following his execution at the gallows. And is that a problem? I believe it is, because your testimony- I keep skipping things today, why? Because your testimony and a particular detail in the report completely contradict one another. Quoi? Are you going to explain yourself, my Nipponese friend? According to her testimony, Madame Tuspells was creating her wax impression just before dawn. And at that time, rigor mortis had not yet set in. Am I correct so far, madam? You are, yes. As I said, the stiffening of the jaw is the first sign of rigor mortis, two to three hours after the death. Oh, if he was dead at midnight, then by three, he would have been ready. But she started at four, a whole hour after. But the man's chin was limp, so he cannot have been dead for a long time. But on the other hand, if you look at Dr. Scythe's report, it quite clearly states the following. Death by hanging confirmed at midnight, 17th June. No. If the professor indeed died at midnight that day, then by the time you were sculpting his face, rigor mortis would have already set in. Oui, yes, you are right. The chin would have been completely stiff. In other words, this report is wrong. So did she forge that autopsy report then? No coroner makes mistakes when recording the time of death. The very idea is absurd. In that case, there's only one possible conclusion. The execution didn't actually take place at the state of time. Impossible! Order! Counsel, this is beyond folly. Not only do you indict the author of the report, Dr. Scythe, but you also impl implicate the members of the staff at Barclay Prison where the execution took place. Boyak! Extraordinary! Get in my day! My learned friend appears to have overlooked one very crucial fact. What fact? The professor died that night, without question. He did, of course he did. I moved the man's limp jaw with my own hands. Yes, the professor died that night. But what if he didn't die at the gallows? He didn't die at... Are you insane? What? What exactly are you suggesting did happen in that case? It's almost impossible to believe, but it would explain the link. Between Dr. Scythe, the professor, and that one other person of interest. I have evidence that will explain exactly what I'm suggesting happened that night. Counsel, present the evidence at once. The evidence that allegedly explains what really happened on the night of the professor's execution. Isn't it this? Because... This Jepper was there. Death by hanging. Quick but painful, so I've heard. If it's done right, I heard your neck just snaps instantly, and so it's very quick. Um, but if it's... If you don't fall fast enough or far enough, then you're just, like, hanging there. Strangling, choking, suffocating to death. That's painful. What happened that night is written very plainly in this newspaper article. An executed criminal returns at the dead of night at a local cemetery. They hung him! He wasn't dead. He crawled out. Then someone shot him, and that's how he died. <gasps> You're suggesting it was a corpse coming back from the dead now. Well, if this article is to be believed, yes. The professor assumed dead following his execution emerged from his grave and was killed again. Don't be a fool. That's simply a rumor published by the gutter press. Can you be certain of that? Are you serious? The point is, as the article says, there was a witness to what happened. A word, indeed. My wee, 
The young man who stole the cemetery into the cemetery by chance that night. Of course there was a witness. The story didn't write itself, but obviously the man made it all up. And in any case, that was ten years ago now. There would surely be no hope of finding him. On the contrary, my lord, we all know this witness well. That's why... That's why Drebber wanted to kill Asmin. Asmin was the other witness. And if Drebber's working together with Scythe, they're obviously c covering something up. And Strongheart is telling him them to cover it up. Oh my gosh, Strongheart, what did you do? What? Are you suggesting, Council, that you've identified the person in question? That you know who claims to have seen these utterly incredible events take place? Yes, my lord. In fact, you could say he's right here before my very eyes. You will substantiate your latest claim now, then, Council. Who is the alleged witness of the staggering scene from the cemetery years ago? I hope I'm right! Uh, save! I'm gonna say Asmund. I mean, he's not right in front of us because he's dead. I must say, I'm quite staggered by the scene I see before me now, Council. That of a young man with his eyes tightly shut, clearly pointing out a rent. A person at rent. Oh, am I wrong? At least have the decency to open your eyes and face the result of your blunder, for heaven's sake. Okay, so I was wrong. So then it is, Drebber. And perhaps you should keep your eyes open when you collapse on the bench, too. Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. It is. Drebber. It's not! Wait, is it? Drebber? The previous witness. The special exhibit in the House of Horrors at Madame Tussauds Museum of Waxwork recreates that decade old scene in great detail. Oh, so it is Drebber. Haha. <laughs> Are you going to look at me and tell me I'm wrong? <laughs> the condemned criminal emerging from the grave and beside the tomb, a young man with a lantern stumbling upon the terrifying sight. And that young man... is a ten year younger Mr. Enoch Drubber. She came down in a bubble, dog! <laughs> Who are you going to sell the house to, Aquaman? <laughs> Order! Surely not, Council. Drebber was there, in Lowgate Cemetery. Um, what is all this talk about Mr. Drebber? Is the name significant? Of course, Madame Two Spells doesn't know, does she? Yes, it's extremely significant, Madam. To your situation as well, in fact. What situation? The theft of the Professor Waxwork from your museum some days ago was perpetrated by the very same man. No! What does that would mean? Madame to spells. It would appear you know the name Enoch Drebber. We, oui. yes, I know it. But from long ago in the past. What? Oh my! Oh gracious! Explain yourself. Tell us everything you know. Yes, yes, of course. Red rum. Red rum. The story of the young man and the terrible sight he witnessed in the cemetery ten years ago was published in every single newspaper in London and throughout Great Britain. However, in all of the articles, the witness was simply described as a certain young man. No details were published about his identity. His name was never revealed. That is, apart from one nosed newspaper. So, Drebber lied about knowing Asmund. He said he only met him a year ago. He knew him. The Daily Circus. It is the newspaper from which the comes the article I have already shown the court. You're saying that his full name was only publicized in that article? Goodness me. Yes, here it is. The university student who experienced this shocking event is Mr. Enoch Drebber. A disciple of science at the University of London and a resident of its student dorms. Instead of Johnny, it's here's Jelly! <laughs> Get an axe, hack down your door, shove my face in it. Unbelievable! When I read the article, I went to meet with a man. His discovery of the condemned criminal coming back to life in the cemetery in the dead of night. 
Make a perfect exhibit for my House of Horrors, but it was the truth or not. I see. So you went to meet Mr. Drebber in order to sculpt the waxwork of the man, did you? Exactement. He was studying science at the University of London in those days. He was just a poor student. I paid him five pounds to model for the waxwork. And since that time, there has been in my museum to recreate the scene of terror from the cemetery. Not an axe, a butter knife. Yes, that will be my weapon, a butter knife. It's a, oh, Golden beat me to it. Heck yeah, butter knife. I will just be a piece of bread wielding a butter knife. Covered in jelly. <laughs> the blood of my enemies. So, ten years ago, a young man appealed to the public about an extraordinary event he'd witnessed. A criminal who had been put to death re-emerging from his grave in the middle of the night. But the public treated his claim as nothing more as an amusing anecdote that was soon forgotten. Ten years later, the same man steals a waxwork model of the executed criminal, osten ostensibly to use as a body double for the victim in the case we're discussing here today. Even though the waxwork's build is a poor match for the victim and its face obscured by a mask. So the question is, why would the man do such a thing? Unless... Okay, so... I think maybe Scythe is working under Strongheart, but she wants to release the truth of the Professor case. So she's like, hey, Enoch, work with me. Let's get this the details of this case to light. Let's go up against Strongheart. Maybe? Oh, my throat. Which brings us to three days ago when the birdcage crashed into the Crystal Tower. If the birdcage had in fact contained not the body of Mr. Asmund, but that same waxwork, the coroner from Scotland Yard who investigated Dr. Scythe would have noticed immediately. And yet she submitted this autopsy report for the victim, which the court has seen earlier. Why? Because the waxwork was that of the professor, is that what you're saying? Dr. Scythe put her name to a document confirming the death of a condemned criminal who was still alive. A criminal whose apparent resurrection was witnessed by Mr. Drebber. But that misconduct was a deadly secret the coroner would do anything to protect. Which is precisely when Mr. Drebber used that particular waxwork as a body double. Ah. My lord. This court must summon Dr. Scythe to the stand. The defense is determined to find out exactly how the coroner and Mr. Drebber are connected. But according to the missive I received this morning through the prosecutor's office, Dr. Scythe is unable to participate in these proceedings. Is that not the case? She told us so herself, didn't she? The defense seeks to be summoning me as a witness. Lord Strongheart is reverted and Lord Strongheart. The Pandora's box you're talking about, Professor Gaines, don't make a mistake and you'll get any information on me. What is happening to stream? Why is it going down so much? Like, my internet is fine. What the heck? Twitch, what is happening? Twitch inspector. Yo, what's up? Hi. Mm. Man. It's like, oh, it's stable. For the 10 seconds you've been up. Like, I don't understand this. What the heck? Why does it keep going down? It's so annoying. Something happened on the night of that killer's execution 10 years ago. And surely nobody would want to get to the bottom of that more than Lord Van Zeeks. The prosecution calls for the instructions of that missive to be scrapped. But, but Lord Van Zeeks, the missive was issued from the Lord Chief Justice's office. He assigned prosecutor as the final say on policy in any particular trial. In other words, me. Yes. Let Enoch Drebber and Dr. Scythe both take the stand together. Order! Very well, I will uphold your request. Bailiff send a subpoena with immediate effect addressed to Dr. Scythe of the forensic investigation team. The woman is compelled to attend on Her Majesty's orders. Alright then, Enoch Drebber and Dr. Scythe. If they weren't colluding with one another, this crime could have never been committed. I'm just a stone's throw away, I can feel it. The truth behind all of this is about to come out. Maybe you need better internet, but I already have the best internet. 
It's so aggravating. Maybe I do need better internet because sometimes when I'm on work calls, it kind of like... It kind of freezes. Come on, Spectrum, what are you doing? Thank you for your attendance at such short notice, Dr. Scythe. I'm disappointed in you, Lord Van Zeex. You've completely betrayed the agreed policy of both Scotland Yard and the Prosecutor's Office. Betrayal is not in my nature, as long as the truth isn't compromised. If it is, if there's even a hint of wrongdoing, then no matter whom it concerns or disgruntles, I will pursue the matter to the bitter end, as would any prosecutor worth his salt. Mr. Drebber, you took the victim's life by means of a machine that you constructed in your workshop. And Dr. Scythe, as the investigating coroner, you were the first on the scene to examine the victim's body. It is the belief that the defense that you collaborated with each other and were both complicit in this crime. And where's your evidence? At present, we have no definitive evidence, but we do have a very significant clue. What are you talking about? I'm talking, of course, about the waxwork. This model of the killer known as the Professor, who was sentenced to death ten years ago. You don't need to tell me. I witnessed the man's execution with my own eyes, and officially pronounced him dead. That remains to be seen. Is that so? According to the newspaper reports from the time on the night of following his execution, the killer came back to life. <laughs> Don't waste my time. And the sole witness to that mysterious event was you, Mr. Drepper, wasn't it? No! Odious man was there too! If what you saw in the graveyard that night ten years ago was something wasn't some chilling fiction but reality, it would make you privy to a very great secret of Dr. Sites. A secret so profound it could compel the coroner to agree to collaborate in your evil scheme, in fact. Oh, is he blackmailing her instead? No, but something has to be up with her and the case in the the professor case. Mr. Drebber, tell the court. Tell everyone the truth of what you saw that night in Lowgate Cemetery. Here's the student who saw it. You can see the resemblance actually the country with the man in the air. Clearly he's not going to claim that's really what he saw, especially not after all these years. There was a research student at the University of London, was he? I bet you're clever for his own good, if you ask me. Cook, cook, cook. What an interesting twist. When at the time, not one person would take me seriously. Yet now here we are, ten years later, and suddenly my story matters, and in a court of law too. Very well then, if everyone so wishes. Let's be frank, I'll tell you the truth of what happened that night, for what it's worth. Are they siblings? Has anyone here actually been in a courtroom during a trial? I have. I have not. I got out of jury duty. <laughs> so, Mr. Trevor. Your testimony, please, about the events of that night ten years ago. You will tell the court exactly what you stumbled across in Lowgate Cemetery. Yes, of course. As you wish. I mean, now I really want to check my internet. Like, why do you guys keep dropping? In the cemetery. The reason I was in Lowgate Cemetery all ten years ago was for a spot of moonlighting, shall we say. Yes, the illustration in that newspaper article was based on what I witnessed that night. But thinking back now, I realized that I never actually saw the professor. Soon afterwards, I was visited by a young woman who sculpted a model of me from wax. Then I gave up on my dream of becoming a scientist, and all be it was all because of that newspaper article. Using a VPN? Nope. I've never been called for jury duty, but I sued someone once, or at least my parents did, and I was there. Oh, dang. Wait a minute. You're claiming you didn't actually see the professor now? Of course, you'd have to screw have a screw loose if you believe the courts could come back from the dead. But, so, you're saying this article is not worth the paper is printed on. I think that would describe it perfectly, yes. Ah. If the details in the article aren't true, it nullifies your argument for why Mr. Drebber and Dr. Scythe have been working together. 
though he is discrediting himself to cripple my arguments. Tell me, witness. You claim to have been in the cemetery on some auxiliary business. Can you elaborate? That's right. Grave robbing, to be precise. As you know, Lowgate Cemetery is at the rear of Barclay Prison. So among students at the university, it had a reputation for being haunted by the ghost of condemned criminals. Grave robbing, you say? Yes, exhuming fresh corpses to sell is reasonably lucrative. Of course, I never laid a finger on any valuables buried with the dead. So you were one of the so-called resurrectionists, a particularly unpleasant scourge on society. Actually, my fellows and I went by another name, the Repurposers. That is quite beyond the pale. You would invite divine retribution, sir. Yes, well, I think I suffered and uh, whatever. The Daily Circus eventually unearthed my name and put it in print. It caused me a great many headaches. In the end, I had to leave the university. That was the only paper with a back race to identify me unambiguously, I might add. I see. Out of interest, who drew the illustration for this article? Ah yes, that was the reporter who exposed me. He sketched that right in front of me as I described the scene. So odious man used to be a reporter. Obviously, as time ticked on, I bitterly regretted what I'd done. Claiming to have seen something I truly, never truly saw. Foolish. Very foolish. Hmm. Well, counsel for the defense, you may proceed to the cross-examination now. At once, my lord. You know who this guy reminds me of. Have you ever seen Death Battle? No, never heard of it either. Uh, spot of moonlighting... Come back now, never realized I saw the professor. You are lying here. What are you talking about? I think I explained already, did it die? Okay, cemetery is at the rear of Barclay Prison. Well, it was renowned among our students at the university for being haunted by the ghost of condemned convicts. For some absurd reason, I was scared of the graveyard at night. And as a result, only too willing to believe that nonsense about death coming back to life. But you said you actually saw it. I said I'd seen what in my mind's eye. After all, the resurrection is impossible, isn't it? You'd have to be unhinged to think otherwise. Unless, of course... You have some evidence that proves I encountered the professor that night. Yes! A bloody camera! Is there any material evidence that could show he really did see the professor? If we have anything at all, Mr. Naruto, I know. I need to present it against that irritatingly backtracking statement of his. The point is, that night was a pivotal moment in my life. I'm just gonna double check with the walkthrough that I do present. Um, the camera. Oh, it's statement four that I press it. Ha ha ha. A young woman being Madame to spells, of course. Precisely. I must say, I didn't expect to run into her again like this ten years later. As I have explained, I went by the name published in the article, and comme ça, I found the man. Yes, the article in the Daily Circus, I think you said. <coughs> For a second, I misread that as Death Note. Rooster Teeth's death battle has a guy who looks strikingly like him. Mmm, Rooster Teeth. I was a poor student with barely a penny to my name at the time. Oh my gosh, you know what's surprising? Okay, <clears throat> Regal, you know how you linked me to that Ruby video? All the fan art I've ever seen of Ruby is like super highly detailed, well rendered, like 2D illustrations of Ruby. But the animation is just such basic 3D stuff. And I'm like, why are the, why is the fan art so different from the, from the animation? It's crazy. It was really weird. And a young lady put five pounds in front of me. So you readily consented to having a waxwork of yourself made and gave permission for it to be put on display. I did. I should sell what little I had to sell, I concluded. Ah, oui, I remember now. I purchased something else from you that day, n'est-ce pas? Mm -hmm. Did you? I can't say I remember. What was it, madam? His camera. Ah! Oh 
Oh yes, I made a point of taking it with me wherever I made an excursion into any cemetery. You took a camera with you, sir. To what end? The recorded details of the bodies I disinterred. But I had no intention of ever visiting a bigger graveyard again after that night, so I sold it. Hmm, I see. But I still have it, monsieur. It's part of the special exhibit in my House of Horrors. I am very meticulous about such details. It is his two spells way. It would seem, then, that this is the very camera Mr. Drebber took with him to Logate Cemetery on the night in question. Yes, interesting. The details of the camera, but I already have the <clears throat> the blood. Okay. So actually, I present tenure article. Hate Ruby. Hate is a strong word. I dislike it. That's because two D will always be better than three D when it comes to animation. Two D is the best. Long live two D. The reason why you don't see much 2D animation in the West is because, like, they did market research, I think. And whenever people hear, oh, something's a 2D animation, they think it's only for children. And so it's not as popular, even though when you look at Japanese anime and you're like, no, like, animation's great. There's crazy good animation and effects and all that. Like, if you watch, you know, My Hero, first season of One Punch Man... Um, Jujutsu Kaisen. And like, you know, there's adult themed stories too, but in the West, everyone's just like, eh, it's so childish. So they don't watch it. And that's why, even if it doesn't look great, uh, all the studios are doing 3D because it will reach a bigger audience. Which sucks because 2D is great. Sorry, Mr. Drummer, but I don't believe that. I like my hero, but never watched One Punch Man, heard of it. What? One Punch Man season one? Freaking great animation. And then I heard season two was just not as great because they switched studios to like supposedly save money or something. But it's just like, that's your downfall. We don't talk about One Punch Man season two. Don't believe what. Your latest claim. You did see the professor on that night 10 years ago. Hmm, oh dear. We seem to be at odds. But I was there, and you were not. I know what I didn't see. The illustration with this article was drawn based upon what you told journalists that you witnessed. A figure emerging from a tomb wearing an iron mask. Yes, when the killer was tried ten years ago. It was decided to, in the closed court's ruling that the man would wear the mask to hide his identity. It wasn't to be removed even during his execution and subsequent burial. Not even the prison wardens were to see the man's face. But obviously, the provision of this mask was not public knowledge. So, Mr. Drebber, as you've just heard... Ah! A lowly student of the University of London certainly wouldn't have known about the condemned man's mask. So unless you'd actually seen the professor that night, it's inconceivable that the artist would have included the mask in that illustration. Ah! People watch anime in 2022? Weeb. I just started watching Fire Force. It's okay. Order! Well, Mr. Drubber? I'm And I'm waiting for Haikyuu Season 5 announcement. I need Haikyuu Season 5. My favorite story arc! It's a vile scene, isn't it? If you look closely. And as I've already point been at pains to point out, I was utterly petrified. Which is why I had it in my head that I'd see such a blood-curling sight. But afterwards, I came to my senses, and I realized that I'd been mistaken. There's blood on the camera, dog. You're still saying you didn't see it? If you're stubbornly sticking to that story, witness, then amend your testimony to explain exactly how you think your eyes deceived you. Of course, of course. Only happy to oblige. One Punch Man Season 2 is dating some level of 2D animation. Ooh, that's bad. I can't believe he's still not going to concede the points. What is he hiding? What are you hiding? When I in fact went this with a fellow grave robber at work. Uh, no. I... Hmm... Okay. Uh... Sorry, I'm cheating, but it's starting to get late, and I'm getting tired. 
What? What? Why not? Oh, I need to press statement three. Frack, I'm losing lives. I need to press this because um, he updated it. Frack! A fellow grave robber, what are you talking about? Well, I wasn't the only one busy in the cemetery that night, you know? Others body snatchers were at work. Of course, when I saw one emerging from the hole he dug, my heart very nearly stopped. But that's the terrifying sight I actually saw, you see. So he saw Courtney coming out. You're claiming it was just another student on equally insalubrious business as yourself. Many of medical students will wear metal masks to protect them from bacteria during dissections. Clearly the fellow was using such a mask to protect his anonymity, wouldn't you say? But there's more to the story, isn't there? The article goes on to say. In the next second, a gunshot rang out suddenly from behind. The bullet pierced the resurrected man's chest, whose breath then stilled once more. We might assume that the sexton dis- ah! Sorry, I dropped my controller. Discovered the miscreants at work, perhaps, and fired upon one of them. If a grave digging- If a grave digger had shot someone in the cemetery, I think it might have been rather big news, my lord. Ah, yes, well. I can only assume it was an embellishment bolted on later by the reporter. Since when were we supposed to wear masks during dissections? When we dissected a pig in ninth grade, all we had was those dumb goggles. Yeah, same. When I dissected a sheep eyeball, it was only goggles. And rubber gloves. Madam Two Spells. Don't take it out on Mr. Sholmes. Ooh la la, pardon. I was lost in my thoughts. Would it be fair to say that Mr. Drebber's last remark was significant to you in some way? I thought it was a little strange, that is all. How Monsieur Drebber could claim this now. If you don't mind me saying, madame, what are you talking about? Well, when I met you ten years ago at your university dormitory, you recounted to me about your adventures in the cemetery, no? Including the gunshots. Stop. You might want to watch your tongue, you know. Have a care, Trevor. That's no way to speak to a lady. Er. Please, Madam Two Spells, carry on. Of course. According to what Monsieur Drebber told me at the time, he did hear a gunshot from behind him and the bullet hit the condemned man. I said nothing of the sort. No, you were very explicit about the details. About the mask that the figure was wearing. And the blood that splattered over you when he was shot. Enough, shut up woman, you're making all this up. I deleted her so I can't send you the photo of Wiz. Just google Wiz death battle. That will do. Mr. Drupper. Hmm, yes. You refute the accounts just given by Madame to spells. I have no recollection of ever saying those things. Come on, do you really expect us to believe you? Control yourself, Council. I will not permit baseless accusations in my courtroom. Right. Under the circumstances, I think it best that you supplement your testimony with a statement to clarify your position on this witness. Very well. Got to tell you, but I became a bard in 14. Bard! Heck yeah! No any splattering, but this is statement number four that I present your bloody camera! Mr. Drubber, do you remember this camera? But that is a camera from the Fateful Night. Yes, we borrowed it from the House of Horrors. It's the camera you took with you to the cemetery that night, Mr. Drubber. And is that supposed to be significant? This kind of camera is rarely seen in our homeland, so my colleague and I were keen to examine it closely. We noticed that the lens extends forwards on the end of some bellows. Like this. What's that? There, just on the bellows. It looks like a dark red stain. Ah. I downloaded the external program that lets me play music auto. For 14? That's right. It's a rather conspicuous mark here on the bellows, in fact. Good lord, are you suggesting? Yes, my lord. It would appear to be a splatter of blood. 
Something that could be confirmed with a simple chemical test. Isn't that right, Dr. Sai? It would be difficult to determine if it was human blood and not the blood of some animal. But yes, to test whether or not it's blood at all is simple enough. And I propose that Madame Two Spell's testimony was correct. And that on the night in question 10 years ago, you were splattered with blood from the gunshot wound. Well, I... And that furthermore, you really did witness the condemned professor emerging from his tomb. Grrr. Nah. There's an external program that plays instrument automatically and you can pick from a list of popular songs. Whoa, is that how people are so good at playing music in 14 if you're a bard? So I'm just like, how do they do this? And I, I couldn't figure it out. Man, cheaters. <laughs> There's simply no way you could have forgotten such a traumatic experience. In other words, the only explanation is that you're trying to hide the fact that you saw the professor that night. But why? Why would they want to do that? Well, not for his own gain, it would seem. For who's then? Who could benefit? Mr. Trevor is obviously lying in order to protect somebody. My goodness, he's shielding someone. Yes, Horton Scythe. Yes, my lord, and clearly... It's someone who doesn't want the truth about the professor coming back to life to be exposed. Well, Council, who is it then? Who is this witness protecting? Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Courtney Scythe. The obvious answer is Dr. Scythe. Scythe? What, whatever do you mean? Imagine if the convict who'd been sentenced to his death was not in fact killed. Imagine if that was to come to light. What are you insinuating? And imagine if the convict in question was the country's most hated mass murderer. If it was the professor. That, that would be an unprecedented scandal. This is beyond a joke. Need I point out that the dead cannot come back to life? What you're suggesting would mean that the execution never actually happens. Yes, that's exactly what it would mean. Once a man is sent to the gallows, he hangs. No one could escape, not in Great Britain. But this was all behind closed doors. But the fact is, there was a witness to the fact that the man did escape his hanging. If that were really true, Council, the implications of misconduct would not stop at the supervising coroner. It would retain the honor of the entire judiciary from the ground up. And it's exactly because of those monumental repercussions that Dr. Scythe would consent to any demand made of her by someone who threatened to expose the secrets, even if that meant being complicit in the crime. You... you mean... I mean that Dr... Ah, frack! Why did it go so fast? I mean that Dr. Sight wasn't collaborating in Mr. Drever's wicked scheme. She was coerced into collaborating in order to protect her decade-old secrets. She switched the, body, the dead body of Mr. Asman with the waxwork model and fabricated the autopsy report. Uh... Oh! Lord Van Zeeks! Pray forgive my freshly filled hollow chalice and a whole raft of other discordancies now. Why did you just put your foot up there? <laughs> Goodness me. It's just the sort of tall tale Londoners would enjoy, I grant you. An executed killer rising from the dead, a Scotland Yard cover-up, a conspiracy at the highest levels. So let me ask you one thing. What's that? If the condemned man really did emerge from his tomb that night only to be shot in the chest, who pulled the trigger? And disposed of him forever? Uh, well, I have no idea at the moment. We have too little information to work out that out at present, I think. I couldn't agree more. The Old Bailey is no place for wild fantasies. Uh, and have you considered this, my learned Nipponese friends? Considered what? Do you, real do you realize what a dangerous endeavor it would be to coerce this woman into such criminal activity? It's a tantamount to declaring war on the entire British police force and judiciary. Right. Hard to imagine any sum of money being offered for research could grant it. Warrant it. To rely on some stage deception when so much is at stake would be madness. Well, I suppose... And this was no petty crime, either. The victim was murdered. 
A man who'd already invested money into the venture and would be instrumental in future profits, too. Yes, I had no reason to kill Messer Asman at all. But you did! Because he drew the picture. Or are you forgetting that his death resulted in me not receiving a single penny? The court is already aware of the contract between myself and the victim, no? Hmm. There is a contract, that's very true. The motive for this case runs deep, though. I can feel it. Using threats to force the head of the forensic investigation team to cooperate is extreme. Especially for a government grant he had no guarantee of receiving in the first place. If the research grant was the aim, taking Mr. Aswin's life would have made no sense anyway. Which means, Mr. Drebber's motive wasn't money at all. He was just trying to kill Mr. Asman. But why? What was his motive then? The newspaper! Your time is up, my learned friend. I'd say you have one last chance before the jury lose their patience with this charade. Let's see if you can back up your heated proposal, shall we? How do you explain why this engineer would throw all caution to the wind and threaten his own country? At this point, I'm not prepared to listen to more of this outlandish conjecture without proof. So, counsel, present your evidence. Alright, who exactly was Mr. Aswin to Drever? There's a connection there, there that no one's seen yet, and I'm going to have to present two pieces of evidence to show what it is. The contract and the newspaper. Duh. Yes, my lord. The evidence that establishes a motive and explains why the witness wants to play the victim is right here. <laughs> It's this newspaper article, my lord. That was written ten years ago, and every detail has been examined already. What can it possibly tell us? That trifle should never have been written. It's typical garter press nothing. And nonsense, that means nothing. A newspaper, how ancient, for real. Yes, on its own, it isn't particularly significant. However, when considered alongside another piece of evidence, it will completely explain your motive for wanting Mr. Asmund dead. What other evidence? Counsel, will you will present your supplementary evidence without delay. The evidence which blah 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 blah. Contract. It's this contract, my lord. Mr. Drebber, this is the contract you signed with Mr. Asman. Yes, that's right. The very document, in fact. That proves I had no reason to kill the man. No, I'm afraid not. What? There's something very significant that this newspaper article and the contract have in common. Really? And it's that common link. That shows very clearly why you were determined to kill Mr. Odious Man. It seems that the defense has uncovered something the rest of us have missed. So, my learned friend, point out what these two pieces of evidence have in common. Where exactly is the link between this newspaper article and the contracts? The signature! What these two pieces of evidence have in common is a signature. A signature? The signature on the illustration that accompanies the 10-year-old article and the signature on the contract. Belong to the same person. What? Ah! As the court has heard, this illustration was drawn 10 years ago by the newspaper reporter who found Mr. Drebber and interviewed him about his ordeal. If you look closely, the reporter's signature can be seen in the bottom right corner of the drawing. And if you look at the contract here, which was signed between the witness and the victim last year, you can clearly see Mr. Asman's signature at the bottom. Let me see now. Good lord, yes, they're identical. In short, the journalist who drew the illustration and wrote the article published about Mr. Drebber 10 years ago to, was the victim of this case, Mr. Odious Man. Ugh. EG. This is all conjecture, Phoenix. <laughs> But explain to the court why. Why would that constitute a motive for the witness to murder Asman? Well, if you think back, you'll remember that Mr. Drebber talked about that article in his testimony. Free dropping, you say? Yes, extremely fresh corpses to sell is reasonably lucrative. Yes, quite beyond the pale. You have no retribution, sir. Yes, well, I think I suffered retribution enough. The Daily Circus eventually unearthed my name, put it in print, caused me a great many headaches, and yet I had to leave the university. I was the only paper with back race to end up by me out of my dearest name, my dad. Then I gave up on my dream of becoming a scientist, and it was all because of that newspaper article. At 
the time, you were a student of the University of London who dreamt of becoming a scientist. However, this single newspaper article changed your entire life. So Mr. Osmond used to be a newspaper journalist, did he? He did, my lord. In fact, it's a widely held belief that Osmond managed to position himself at the heart of his criminal network, thanks to the many dubious connections he made during his time as a reporter. So you had to give up on your dream and leave university. You lost everything. Eventually- <coughs> Oh, sorry, Spit. Eventually you find yourself working in the field of science, but only in shadows. And all because of that article, written by Mr. Asman. Enough! Stop this endless dribble about my life. What? Explain yourself, Mr. Dribble. Yes, that's true. I had to leave the university as a result of that article. But it was just a straw that broke the camel's back. What do you mean? Almost every student of science in the faculty was too poor to actually conduct any research. But they struggled on their, with their hypothesis anyway. We all did, only to have them taken by vultures. Sooner or later, you knew your ideas would be stolen and passed them by some wretch or other after all. Good gracious. Making a name for yourself as a scientist in a climate like that was a miracle only a select few geniuses could ever hope to achieve. Personally, I wasn't one of those geniuses, so it was hardly a wrench. Being forced out of university because of Lowgate was the best thing that could have happened to me. Mr. Drebber, do you genuinely believe that? Of course I do. Who is better placed to know whether or not I possess a talent for science than me? I'm sorry to say that your words don't ring true at all. How dare you. And I have evidence to prove it. How are you in a position to say anything about me? I don't know you from Adam. Fine, if you think you have evidence, go ahead, show it. What could you possibly have to disprove the idea that I was happy to leave the university because I lack talent? Your trophy. Do you remember this, Mr. Trapper? We found it at your workshop. Is, is that a Royal Society trophy for excellence in science? What exactly is a trophy council? It's the greatest honor that can be bestowed on a young scientist, my lord. There's no higher accolade. It recognizes emerging talent and it promises a bright future. Oh gracious. Your prospects for the future were excellent, weren't they, Mr. Drebber? Because even then you were a genius in your field. But you lost everything. You had no more future. Your talents would go to waste. All as a result of this one newspaper article. I don't know when you realized who Mr. Asmund was, but when it dawned on you that he was the same journalist who 10 years ago ruined your life. It's abundantly clear that you had no intention of forgiving the man. So what does Courtney Scythe have to do with all of this? The truth is... Finally, he's going to fold. I don't think he is. Oh no, is it going to be Strongheart? It's going to be Courtney. <sighs> Fine. Clearly this has run its course now. But... I admit it. All of it. What? What are you doing? It's exactly as the Japanese man said. I was coerced into going along with this man's plot to murder the victim. On the condition that he kept my dirty secret from ten years ago. I... No. Good lord! Is he... Is she just ditching him now? Does she not care? Dr. Scythe. Do you realize what you're saying, woman? It's all true. That day. When I arrived at the Crystal Tower and saw the birdcage, my heart nearly stopped beating. That memory from a decade ago that I'd done my best to bury deep inside myself. It was the, pers uh, it was the professor again, staring me in the face. And then, before I had a chance to react, I noticed something else. He has an envelope! There was a note tucked inside the model's jacket. 
Block the scythe. You will go along with my plan. I'm someone who knows the truth about what really happened that night ten years ago. All the instructions were there in the note. Every detail was meticulously written out. I had no choice but to do what it said. I made the necessary alterations to the scene and fabricated the autopsy reports as instructed. There was really no other choice. It had to be done to protect the judiciary. I can only apologize now. But why lie in the first place? That's the mystery. Why on earth would you buckle now? Well, there's no point in trying to hide it anymore, is there? I would have done anything to stop it coming out, even collaborate in a murder. But the great lie about that execution ten years ago has been exposed. Whatever happens, I'm finished. So then, Mr. Drebber, what do you say to that? Your accomplice has admitted everything. So then, who shot the professor coming out of the grave? And why did they have to lie about his execution in the first place? Surely it goes without saying. You admit your part in it too, then? I admit nothing. At all. What? Have you forgotten that Kinesis machine was ripped to shreds by an explosion? Short of me admitting to a crime, there's really no possible way for you to prove I did anything wrong. No! Order! Whatever this man says, I admit everything. He threatened to expose my secrets, so I went along with his plan. And Lord Van Zeeks. Yes? I hope you'll accept my apologies. What happens next is in your hands, of course. I've heard more than enough now. I hereby present the final finds of this court. Wait, but we still don't... No, we still can't really prove that he did- what? This trial is not the proper forum in which to pursue the alleged wrongdoings of Mr. Drebber. The defendant is Professor Albert Herbrain. Very true. It had slipped my mind. Isn't he one of your friends? <laughs> As the court has heard, Dr. Scythe has admitted to allegations brought by the defense. Thereby absolving the defendant of any possible guilt. You- you mean- at the present time, it is in the conclusion of this court that the defendant was not involved in any wrongdoing. But we still didn't defin definitively prove that it was Drever. Because we're like, yeah, he wanted to kill Asman. But was this really just an accident or real? I mean, I guess since Courtney... Um... Since Courtney... Uh... Confessed. Me! <laughs> Does the prosecution have any objection? None, my lord. Well, congratulations, Mr. Naruhodo. Proving Professor Hairbane's innocence. But did we really? Without further ado, then, the adjudication. Unless the prosecution or defense have any other matters to discuss. I don't know. This doesn't feel quite right. Why did Dr. Scythe suddenly admit to it like that? Is everything all right, Mr. Nadahudo? Like you said before, the way the trial is set to end now, the judge will certainly deliver a verdict of not guilty. But is that really what we want? What the defense should be punish pushing for now is... I have a feeling we're gonna have to push for a further testimony, but... Does that mean this keeps going? Science trophy... Ah, oh, gosh darn it! Oh, we still have a lot more to do! Frag! The defense objects to the trial ending at this time. I beg your pardon. We demand one final testimony. The ride never ends. Okay, since it's going on for so long, I'm gonna use the um I'm gonna use the walkthrough. You do realize I'm about to adjudicate in favor of your client, I presume. What are you playing at now, my Nipponese friend? Why would you want to obstruct a conclusion of trial at this point? 
No defense lawyer in his right mind would do that. Mr. Naruhodo, what exactly are you thinking? The truth, the whole truth, and a way to bring it all about. Right. Yes, in hindsight. Ah, oh, yes, one word of warning before I go. If in total trial you perceive in a shadow of doubt about the truth, don't let it ever say. Pursue it like a dog with a bone. Ah. Get a better end, you understand? Do not falter whatever may come to pass. It's only one more testimony, and now it's just boop, boop, boop. I'm sure Mr. Sholmes knew. He must have deduced that this would happen. Yes, I'm here to in court to advocate for my client and to secure an acquittal. Obviously. But that's not all. I believe I have a duty to court to pursue the whole truth of case until- Oh, excuse me. Every last detail is laid bare. And that is why the defense calls for further testimony from Dr. Scythe. Testimony from me? About what? About the nature of your collaboration with Mr. Enoch Drubber. Huh. In the case it's except escaped your attention, I've already admitted to everything I did. The whole truth has already been re revealed. Stop wasting everyone's time. Ah! As his lordship made very plain, your client will get the acquittal you wanted for him. There's simply no point protracting this business further with another tedious cross-examination. Throw it faster. Pray forgive my careless handling of that hollowed bottle. I slipped. That's what you call it. What is your objection, Lord Van Zeeks? The prosecution. Also calls for supplementary testimony from the witness. Don't be stupid. If there is more to this case that has yet come to light, then I will join my learned friend in pursuing the facts until the bitter ends. What? Lord Van Zeeks! Sholm's always spoiling things. I know, right? Just... Yeah! This is most irregular, to say the least. However, as the prosecution also calls for it, I will uphold the request. Dr. Scythe, you will testify for the court, explaining the full extent of your involvement in the murder apparently committed by Mr. Drubber. Aye. Very well. Let's make this snappy! Oh, my biceps hurt like crazy. It all began at the scene when I saw the waxwork and the note tucked inside its jacket. The actual body of the victim, as indicated in the note's instructions, was beneath the experimentation stage. The body had to be arranged in certain ways to implicate the defendant, which was my job. I enlisted the help of the entire forensic investigation team to dress the scene appropriately. The truth about the execution ten years ago is a state secret at the highest level. I had to protect it. Sorry about using the walkthrough, but I really want to finish this. BriarTheMusicPlayer.com, thank you! That was right, the stage and the mu machine were all specifically designed for the deception. So it seems, and all meticulously prepared, you did well to see through it. You're a very shrewd boy. So kind of you to say. And what about the autopsy report then? All I did was record the location of the body as being in the Crystal Tower instead of under the stage. That's all? That's a terrible corruption! Only my team were aware of the deceit, and then only under my explicit instructions. Nobody else at Scotland Yard knew anything about it, I assure you. Hmm, we must be thankful for small motions, I suppose. Well, I believe that testimony has clarified everything. There's no particular need for a cross-examination, I would say. No, I disagree. I can't shake the feeling that something's wrong. Just look at that expression of Dr. Sy's face. It's the defense's right to cross-examine any witness following testimony. <sighs> what is it about you Japanese that makes you all so doggedly persistent? What is it about you Londoners that lie about everything? Ooh. And well, if you so desire, counsel, proceed with the cross-examination. Yes, my lord. Ah! Last cross-examination! When you say arranged, I presume you mean with this. Yes, the instructions in the engineer's note said something along the lines of... Fabricate some evidence to make it clear that Hairbrain alone could have killed Asmund. So, you mean that was your doing? I fetched Hairbrain's ridiculous screwdriver from the stage. I took it with me alone to the abyss under the stage where the bird hitch had fallen. Alone, Doctor? I didn't feel it would be appropriate to involve anybody else in that particular part of the deception. She killed him! She killed him! There was a void under the stage where I found the birdcage lying in the dirt. 
I approached it, leaned down, and slowly opened it up. Then, I took the screwdriver in both hands and plunged it into the man's chest. And then you noted that you're in your fake autopsy report as a fictitious cause of death. Exactly. So, the actual cause of death was... The trauma resulting from the 30-foot drop. No, you stabbed him! A word. Oh, so, or he did die from the drop and she just... She just stabbed him after the fact? What is it, Mr. Sato? Something about Dr. Sai's last statement. It's playing on my mind, that's all. Yes, mine too. Dr. Scythe. There's really no need to shout. I can hear you perfectly well. The defense calls for you to add what you just said to your formal testimony. Oh? Which part? What I wanted to supplement her testimony is... Um... Uh... Oh my gosh. This doesn't say! Uh, here you want to press statement 3. It will give you the option of... What question, what to question on. So you want to pick the choice about stabbing Mr. Asman. What she did to the victim. How you stab Mr. Asman in the chest? That part. Fine, if that's what you want, but there's really no need to point. The prosecution concurs. But well, you will supplement your testimony now with this. If you wish, my lord. Sort of the victim's corpse where it lay in the toppled cage and plunged the screwdriver into his chest. Uh, okay. Present photograph of the victim. I've got a nasty feeling that this inconsistency pro points to an extremely uncomfortable truth. What on earth is the matter, Council? Have you lost your tongue? I apologize, my lord. Dr. Scythe, in that last statement of yours, there's just one point. That seems to defy explanation. Out with it, my learned friends. There's, ob there's an obvious inconsistency between your description and this photograph. Look at this graph. Which shows the victim in the bird cage following the events that led to his death. The court has already examined that photograph in depth. There's nothing new we can learn from it. Yes, we have already considered it, that's true. But we now know the facts to be different. What do you mean? I believe we should let the defense explain. Where in this photograph will we see the alleged inconsistency with the witness's statement? Supposedly, it's the stabbing. Look closely at the bloodstain on the victim's chest. This clearly extends in a downward direction towards the man's feet. And why- Because <gasps> if he was just lying down, the blood would spread everywhere. But this one's going down. Why is that? Why is that significant, Counsel? If the victim was stabbed in the moments before the kinesis machine was set into motion, that's entirely expected. Ah! Oh, of course, no, that's not what happens. Exactly, my lord. Dr. Scythe made it very clear in her testimony just now, at the point at which she stole Professor Hairbrain's screwdriver and stabbed the victim. It was after the grand deception was set in motion when the birdcage had fallen below the stage out of sight. From the shape of it, it's clear that the birdcage would have fallen on its side after the 30-foot drop. And if the victim had really been stabbed whilst inside that birdcage in that position, the blood from the wound would have spread out equally in all directions. Were it to have formed a long... Longitudinal appearance we see in the picture is in inconceivable. Getting stabbed in the chest. That sucks, so I've heard. I've heard that too. Ah. Given that the victim's blood seeped vertically downwards from the wound, it must be the case when you stabbed Mr. Asmund, he was standing up. In short, Dr. Scythe, she was on the platform! Your latest testimony was a total fabrication. Ah, ah. I knew it, I was right. Now I've identified that contradiction, there's only one way to explain the facts. We've all been under a great misapprehension here. What? 
What sort of misapprehension? Dr. Scythe. You claim you were coerced into helping Mr. Drebber as a result of the note he left in the waxwork. You claim that you made changes to the scene of the crime to implicate the defendants. And you claim that you authored a fake autopsy report to cover your tracks. But one of those claims is an out-and-out -out lie. Because the question of what the bloodstain really tells us has only one possible answer. If that is the case, what is it, man? Counsel, you clearly struck up on a revelation. Now tell the court what it is. Which part of Dr. Sy's story is shown to be a lie by the contradiction in her testimony? The stabbing of the victim, is it not? No. The answer is very simple if you consider the sequence of events. If when the victim was stabbed, the blood from the wound seeped downwards, as it did, we can be sure that the victim must have been either sitting or standing upright at the time. But as you rightly pointed out, the birdcage would have fallen on its side when it fell beneath the stage. <laughs> she lying! Yes, it would, which tells us that the victim must have been in that position of his own accord. That's impossible. The man was dead, remember? No, that's the misapprehension. When the birdcage fell from the stage in the void below, it must have hit the ground with considerable force. He was alive. He tried to get up. She stabbed- oh. That is so gnarly. But Mr. Asman didn't die in the fall. He probably lost consciousness for a while, but when he came round, he got to his feet to climb out of the cage. Just as Dr. Scythe appeared. If the victim was in fact alive at that point in time, it changes everything. Uh, ah! Ah! Mr. Mr. Odious Man's killer wasn't the defendant, Professor Albert Harebrain, nor was it the mastermind behind the stage trickery, Mr. Enoch Drubber. It was you, Dr. Courtney Scythe. Uh, uh. Shocked toast. For real! Your job is to prove your client innocent, not find the killer. In this game, we gotta find the killer. Order! Can this possibly be true? Have you been taking me for a fool? It was you, was it? You killed him? You hoped that by admitting to being an accomplice in Mr. Drebber's scheme, the trial would end, before you were accused for a far worse crime. Cold-blooded murder. Oh, do shut up. You're so desperate now, you're making all this up, as if I would do something like that. I assure you, the defense is not desperate, Doctor. Mr. Naruhuro has an established the facts using evidence and logic alone. Ha! <laughs> logic. Don't make me laugh. Sadly, your logic has a gaping hole in it. What? What do you mean? I'd have thought it was obvious. A motive, boy. You're lacking a motive. What possibly possible reason would I have to kill Mr. Asman? Asman was involved in any number of criminal activities, from coercion to theft to murder. But there is no known connection to Dr. Scythe there. Hmm. I'm rather relieved to say it does seem somewhat far-fetched. True, there's no obvious motive, but there's still something in the back of my mind. I feel sure I've seen something somewhere that hints at why the coroner might have done this. Yes, I might have tampered with the crime scene and concocted a fake report. But murdering someone for no reason is a very different story. No. When you questioned what possible reason you could have had for wanting to kill Mr. Asman, something did come to mind. What? 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 What does the council enlighten the court at once? Yes, we saw it yesterday, didn't we? Something that seemed strange, but we had no reason to suspect it at the time. Oh, that weird, um, book with the... There's a particular object that explains why Dr. Scythe would have wanted to kill Mr. Asman. All the scalpels, why would you need 500 scalpels? It's a scalpel, or rather, scalpels. Did you say scalpels? Ah. Oh. It would appear that word has struck a chord, Doctor. You. 
come on, out with it. It was yesterday when we visited your laboratory. Oh, the book. Uh, I mean, scalpels. <laughs> Look at this thick book here. Oh, it appears to be a counting ledger for spending. Eh? What is it? It's clear that routine purchase value is a but... Well, why don't you seem strange? Really? In what way? You're buying 500 scalpels every month. Five hundred scalpels a month. At first, I wondered what on earth you could be using that many scalpels for. But actually, I realize now it's not the scalpels themselves that are significant. It's the money for them disappearing every month from the department's accounts. Aspen's criminal organization relied heavily on extortion for its funding, tracing the money from the forensic investigation team's account to find out where it was going. Would be extremely straightforward. Uh... Ten years ago, when Mr. Asman was still a journalist and wrote this article about Mr. Drebber, he may well have stumbled upon information as he was researching the story. Information relating to Dr. Sai's dark secret that he would use to rack money from her for the next decade. Darkest secret? Good lord, you mean... I don't know what happened on the night of that execution ten years ago, but clearly the opportunity to rid yourself of that menace was too tempting to pass up. So in the end, you weren't coerced at all, were you? You did it entirely of your own free will. You stabbed Mr. Asman in the heart with all your might. To silence the blackmailer who knew your dark secret forever. It wasn't Drebber who knew her secret, it was Asman. Never understand. None of you. But we've had to keep covered up all these long years. But, oh well, truth will out. They both had motives for wanting to kill Asmund. She just got to him first. She wanted to pin the blame on Drebber. As very little of the machine remains after it was ripped apart by the bomb, the truth of this case can never be properly established unless you speak out. And if you decide not to, it's very possible that Courtney Scythe will escape punishment for her crimes. Please, sir, own up to what you've done and tell the court the truth about what happens. Don't take the fall. Ten years ago, you told the truth and you were robbed of a bright and successful future as a result. I can certainly understand your bitterness and your consternation now. However, this is surely the chance you've been waiting for to sever the hold that fate's had over you all these years. Super high voltage instantaneous kinesis. I mean, really. As the adult brain mock scientists that are the worst, you know. They don't recognize the fact that they don't have talent. They can't even get that right. And so they end up chasing impossible dreams, having unbridled faith in their abilities. They go on and on about their wonderful hypotheses, their stupid eyes shining like the, a little child's. They make me sick. I can't abide their foolishness. Careful, Mr. Drebber. I wasn't particularly pleased with the kinesis machine. Made for quite a show, didn't it? So you admit it. You admit that it was nothing more than a sham made for the purpose of killing the victim. Yes, I admit it. I did it all in the name of revenge. Revenge for the future that Mr. Aslan's article had deprived you of ten years earlier. But the revenge you sought didn't stop at Aslan, did it? Which is it? Which is where that very particular waxwork comes in. Yes, I see. Playing the blame game with murder doesn't sound fun. I never want to be involved in a murder, and I hope I never get involved in a murder. <laughs> the condemned convict that you saw rising from the grave in Logate Cemetery ten years ago. Your account of those events were all true. Then obviously, Scotland Yard couldn't afford to acknowledge what had happened. Even if it meant discrediting a bright young man and crushing any future career he might have had. So your plan required that you adduct that particular waxwork model in order to exact your revenge on Scotland Yard as well, or on Dr. Scythe, to be precise. It was a year ago. By some extraordinary twist of fate, Asman turned up at my workshop. He didn't remember who I was, of course. He just wanted to employ my services as an engineer. 
and he happened to have a paper with him. An article on the front page caught my eye about the coroner who'd handled that bogus autopsy being appointed head of a new forensic team. When I learned that news, my cognitive processes started to revise the plan. What a hard tale. It robbed me of my future, so I wanted to use the man's own wiles against him for revenge, and have that rotten, scar rotten Scotland Yard eating out of my hand at the same time. I wanted them all to suffer the same humiliation I'd had to suffer. But you didn't kill the dude! <laughs> Your actions against those who'd ruined your future were justified as revenge, at least to yourself. Certainly, no one has the right to destroy another's prospects, especially for purely selfish gain. And yet, that's what's happening in the world right now. In carrying out your plan, you did exactly that to someone else, didn't you? Did I? Yes, to Albert! Professor Harebrain's only crime was passion for his hypothesis. But you had no compunction about sacrificing his future to affect your revenge. You knew that he would be forever banished, branded a failure and a fraud. Perhaps life treated you unfairly ten years ago and the other's misconduct left your life in tatters. But remember this. Your own actions resulted in exactly the same thing for another perfectly innocent young man. Aye. Aye. So they're not related. They're not siblings. I was wrong about that. Lord Vanzix, what of Dr. Scythe? An immediate warrant for her arrest has been granted and she's been remain remanded in custody, my lord. But Strongheart's gotta get her out somehow. I presume she will face trial in the coming days along with Mr. Drever. A most regrettable situation indeed. She's made great contributions to her profession over the years. It's really a hard truth to swallow. However, that is a topic for some future occasion. For now, Professor Herbrain! Oh, um, yes. Seems that there was a great deal more to your experiment than you realized. However, I think we can assume now that all the sort of details have been brought to light. This has been a very long and profound trial, but I'm pleased to say you are absolved of all guilt. This whole experience has taught me a very great, but painful lesson. I've- I've been- I mean, me, this dedicated scientist, this- this devotee of natural philosophy. I've been selfish and self-centered above all. A fool. Yes, sir. I spent my life thinking of nothing but my research. Discardedly believing that I could do whatever I set my mind to despite my lack of talent. And the worst of it is, in the process, I've caused others pain and misery. Others who are far, far greater people than I. No, Professor, that is not true. What? Don't tar yourself with the same brush as Drebber. What happened was his doing and his alone. This outcome is his fate, not yours. You're not to blame in any way. Lord Van Ziegs. And the derision with which he referred to you earlier, calling you a fool, talentless even. It's true. The man has no idea. To believe in yourself and work for your fingers to the bone to realize your dreams. That's laudable, not laughable. No one has the right to deride another for such choices. Oh. Thank you, Barak. So, ladies and gentlemen of the jury... Yes, my lord! This court's expectation that you find a defendant not guilty of the charge which he stands with presumed objections... No, for me, my lord! No, no, no. This trial has really made me think, but it's the right decision. It's all been proven methodically, regardless of you, no misgivings whatsoever. Mm, what's that? It's still uneasy. It's all over. I don't know, it's become the yard these days, I don't recognize the place. Very well, in that case, I hereby pronounce the defendant not guilty. And now, closing conversation, and then we could be done after three and a half hours. Whoa! What is adjourned? It is 11.18. Wow. It's over! That was some trial. Uh, maybe I should have split up the trial parts into two different streams, but I was just like, it's gonna end soon. Nope! Ugh, <sighs>
finally done with this game. No, there's two more trials. Three and a half hours of toast. It's definitely been burnt by now. <laughs> I am so tired. I'm soggy toast now. Professor, what a splendid outcome, isn't it? Oh, it is, it is. Congratulations, Professor Hairbrain. Mr. Naruto, Mr. Sato, I'm truly, truly beside myself with gratitude. How could I ever thank you enough? I'm just glad it's all been cleared up that you realize you were just caught up in a bad situation. Ah, uh, right now, you know, I had that research grant money. Ah, uh, I give the whole lot to you. Every penny. Well, that's very kind, but I'm just a student, so... You don't need any financial reward. Your acquittal is more than enough. No, money is always important. <laughs> oh dear, what can I do? Aha! Uh -huh. How about this? As a memento, the paper about my hypothesis is inside. Well, just as a memento then. Thank you. I've been wondering, Professor. What are you going to do now? Oh, oh my. Yes, what am I going to do? My hypothesis and my great machine lie in ruins. But still, it's been too long since I was last in London, so perhaps I'll enjoy some sightseeing. Let's explore the great exhibition whilst I'm here too and see if new inspiration hits me. Oh yes, that's a wonderful idea. I can't allow that! Lord Van Zeeks, what are you doing in here? Eric! I'm sorry you had to go through all that, Albert. Well, if I'm honest, it was terrifying. You are like a great demon behind your bench there, sh snarling down on your prey. Oh, I didn't think he'd talk. You're one of the few true friends I have. I couldn't leave it to anybody else to handle the prosecution or the defense. How is this like a 20-hour game? Because there's a ton of dialogue. You be safe, don't get sick traveling. Oh, I'm not gonna travel. My family's coming to me, so I'm staying right at my house. <laughs> Sorry? Or to defense? Did did I just hear that right? I always knew that you had my best interests at heart, don't worry. Ah, how about you show me around while I'm here in town? It's been a long time since we left university. We have a lot to catch up on. Listen, Albert. In a few days, your acquittal will be made official. When that happens, you must head straight to Dover. I'll accompany you. What? From there, you'll cross the channel and make your way back to Germany. I've already purchased the tickets. What? But no! Hold on a minute, Barrack! What about the Great Exhibition? There's a chance of a- No. No sightseeing, Albert. Give up on the idea. Ah, uh, Sometimes it's hard to see any warmth in those eyes, Barrack. Um, Lord Van Zeeks? What's all this about? Unnecessary precaution. Yes, I think I understand. You do? Well, Iris told me that when you met Lord Van Zeeks at his office some days ago, he asked how Mr. Natsume was doing. Yes, that's right. I remember him being surprised at the time and thinking it was nice of him to ask. The point is, Mr. Natsume is still alive and well. Even though, it's been more than six months now since he stood trial with the Reaper as a prosecutor. Maka! Thank you so much for the 22 months sub! I'm tired. Ah, you mean... The Reaper's influence doesn't stretch overseas. Those in the Reaper's sights meet their ends or ends days or sometimes months after their acquittal. That's been the pattern up to now. But of course, we know that both Mr. Natsume and Gina were completely innocent. True. And perhaps that governs the Reaper's actions. The truly innocent are spared. But they don't want to take any chances with a close personal friend. But, Eric. Like the mustached Nipponese, this man should leave the country without delay. That's why. I'm packing him off to Germany at once. Right. Does your friend shape package get any say in it? Goodness, was this your intention all along then, Lord Van Zeeks? In court where people think of him as the Reaper, this man seems absolutely merciless, and yet, sometimes I feel as though I don't understand him at all. It's time to go, Albert. Back to the prison for time being. Oh, yes. All right. Well then, Mr. Nadoro. Thank you so much for everything. Not at all, Professor. It was a pleasure getting to know you. Best wishes, Professor Hairbrain. Well, once the dust is settled, you must come and visit me in Germany. Anyway, goodbye for now. Now, my Nipponese friend. Oh, yes, I thought you'd gone too. 
We have matters to discuss. Can you spare me some time? Not right now! You wanna talk with me? I'll be waiting in the courtroom in 10 minutes. Well, that was strange. For some reason, I didn't get the sense of impending doom as he walked away this time. The Enigma, Barak von Zeeks. What does he want to discuss, I wonder? The answer awaits in the courtroom, I suppose. Here goes then. No! No! You love Gangan Ropa? Why? Oh my! So, are you satisfied you saved a guileless scientist from a great injustice? Um, yes, I think so. I'm relieved at least that the man's innocence could be proven. Anyway, I imagine you've been wondering where my animosity towards you Nipponese comes from. Well, at first I thought you just didn't like me. I imagined you saw me as a pretentious child from an unimportant land who had no business being here. But now, I think differently. You clearly know our ways. I would guess that some specific incident led to your thorough dislike of my race. Will you tell me what happened, please? The professor. I thought that I'd never hear that name in this courtroom again, to be honest. He took your brother's life. Clint. My brother was Clint Van Zeeks. Sixteen years ago, when I was still just in my teens, he was already the director of prosecutions and a key member of the judiciary. I looked up to him, he was everything I aspired to be. Poor JT suffering. I just... It's almost midnight! <laughs> he was involved in the establishment of justice systems in foreign countries as well. There were exchange programs between Britain and other nations then too to share knowledge and ideas. As part of one of those programs. Three judicial students came to Britain from your homeland, the Empire of Japan. Oh. If it was 16 years ago, then one of them could have been my father. Of course. I remember Dr. Mikotoba well. I had no idea. I was a minor at that time, training at the prosecutor's office. One day, Clint introduced me to three visiting Nipponese. So, you've actually met my father. He and his colleagues were polite and amicable. They were adept at their work and exacting in their standards. It was my first encounter with the Nipponese spirit, and it made a very good impression on me. But six years later, that's when it happened. The investigation was going nowhere. There were no suspects, even. Just an ever-growing list of victims. And in the end, my brother became one of them. The last, in fact, before the case was finally resolved. So sorry, Lord Van Zeeks. Truly. Clint was always ready to put his life on the line for justice anyway. But he wouldn't have wanted it any other way. He lost his life to the killer, but his, it was his victory in the end. For me personally, though, it was a great loss. I found myself in a very dark place indeed. When I finally found out the killer's identity, the reason why no one had been able to catch the man sooner ceased to be such a mystery. He'd been hiding in plain sight all the time. In plain sight? Are you aware of political events 10 years ago? It was a period of extremely sensitive diplomacy between the British and the Japanese empires. A new treaty was being forged, I think. Correct. The Anglo-Japanese Treaty of Friendship and Navigation was being concluded. The leaders of both countries were deep in extensive political discussions. Which is why this particular killer's appearance in court was conducted as a close trial. If the British public had known the identity of the killer, not only would the treaty have been in jeopardy, but our two nations could very well have ended up at war. It was a Japanese man. A war? Between Britain and Japan? But that would mean... Oh my! You mean to say the professor was... When the trial reached the conclusion, I thought to myself, yes, it's time. Time for you to come face to face with this hideous monster. <laughs> I borrowed the key for, for the mask from the proprietors of the Waxwork Museum. So see for yourselves now. Confirm it with your own eyes. The truth that's been hiding this past decade. Yet he wants to sleep. Here's my full life story. <laughs> That's the professor. Yes, that's him. Until now, the thought never even crossed my mind. Yeah! 
that the mass murderer whose crime struck Britain as never before was Japanese. Wait a minute. That face. Feel as though I've seen it somewhere. It's strangely, it's strangely familiar. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> it is him! Oh, it's his dad! Oh my gosh! Kazuma! My best friend! Kazuma Asogi! <gasps> My, I have such a blood rush. Oh, I'm feeling lightheaded. Oh. <laughs> After a whole year, finally his memories returned. Oh, I'm so lightheaded. Oh my gosh. He stood there before me. Ryunosuke! Oh! Hello again. It's been a while. Tomoyo. Oh, my friend! Kazuma-sama! <laughs> Been a very long. Thank you. Thank you for guiding my friend here when I could not. <laughs> she just said his name, but it, the translation was it was an honor. Hug. Hug. He stayed on I knew you wouldn't die that easily. Kazuma. I owe you thanks too. For taking good care of that in my absence. Karma. Karma, the great blade of the Asogi clan, passed down to the generations. JT wants to sleep. Here's my full life story. <laughs> There's a mouse there. Yeah, he has a little mouse on his shoulder. I have no idea what's happening. Wait, he died. Yeah, we thought he died in the second case of the first game, but he's alive. When we left Japan, the sword was at my friend's side. A Japanese man's katana is his soul, and he couldn't be parted from it. But then when the incident happens... It was Susato-san's wish that I inherit the sword. Oh, she has a little bunny on her bag! And I've kept it with me ever since, along with my memories of the friendship we shared. With this by my side, I always felt that you were watching over me somehow. Now you can defend with us. Yeah, to. I did at last, Father. Are you saying you knew all this time? 
Looking at it, but I still can't believe it. Mass murderer is Kazuma's father. Are you gonna slice it? It's wax. Is this... Is this what you needed to come to England to do? We have much to talk about, but now is not the time. You're not coming with us? I'll be seeing you. Did you leave me? Why did you leave me? That's all Kazuma said. Before he turned and left us there in the courtroom. Did he definitely die with a stab or something? He fell and hit his head. That's not how wax works. That would have gotten stuck in there. Yeah, it would have. So he's the living afterimage of the man who took my brother's life, is he? Yes, Kazuma Asogi, my best friend. Three months ago when Lord Strongheart introduced us. I had an inkling there was something there, some connection. But why did Lord Strongheart do that? Why did he make Kazuma Lord Van Zeke's apprentice and when he was suffering amnesia too? The man was uh, apprehended, even executed. But his legacy just won't die. That's the sad truth. Anyway, that's all I had to say. I thank you for meeting with me as asked. So, are you going to keep him as your apprentice? Like, he's the son of the dude who killed your brother. You okay with that? Ten years ago, my grandmother took me to the railway station. When we were, we were there to meet my father from the train, for me... It was the first time I'd ever seen him. Poor Susatsu-san, all this is tied up with painful memories for her too. She's never talked about this with me before though. It took time to adjust to having father around, but when I was just starting to get used to it, he called me into a study one day. He told me that a great friend of his had passed away in London, and that the friend had left behind a son, a boy seven years my senior. Father told me the boy had made a promise to his late father, so he was starting to become a defense lawyer. I wanted to help, so I studied to become a qualified judicial assistant. And I'm sure you've worked out. That young man's name was Kazuma Asogi. So you see, that's how he and I met. For a brief moment, my great friend had returned, only to disappear again all too soon. So he wasn't actually racist, he just hates what's-his-face because they were best friends. But I don't think he knew about Kazuma and our connection. Or Oh no, he did because he's like, hey, you weren't supposed to come here. Kazuma was. That's why he hated me. Here's Susato's life story too. I know, for, for real. But in that fleeting encounter, something stirred. Something that had been dormant for a long time. As if great wheels had been set in motion, I could almost hear them creeping into life. In some ways, it was the end of a chapter, but in many, it was the start of a new one. Please, no more. I'm tired. It is 11.37. Okay. <sighs> Holy moly. Holy moly. Wow. Wow. Twisted karma in his last bow. Oh, gosh. Okay, well... That's it for me tonight. It's 11.38. I'm tired. It's been a long road. Hopefully before I stream next time, I'll figure out why the heck my stream keeps dropping. If it's either internet or if it's um, Twitch. But I'll see what I could do to kind of solve the problem.
But yeah, that's gonna be it for me tonight. Uh, thank you everyone for sticking around for so long. It's super late, and a lot of you are in like earlier time zones than me. But thank you so much for sticking around, and um, yeah, thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Stay toasty. Have a good night. Sleep well. Uh, see you next time. Bye.